subjects of our dread sovereign, Lord King James, by the grace of God, of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, King, Defender of the Faith, having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our King and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid, and by virtue hereof do enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and officers, from time to time, as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience, in witness whereof we have hereunto subscribed our names, at Cape Cod the 11th of November, in the reign of our sovereign Lord King James of England, France, and Ireland, the 18th, and of Scotland, the 54th, Anno Domini, 1620. Fudge away quickly and fill the black bowl, devoutly as long as we are now welcome, good fellows, both strangers and old. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. His mercy ever is the same. dawn's early light, what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets regular the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner yet wave for the land of the Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and through you to town meeting members, residents of Plymouth, town and school staff, advisory and finance committee members, school committee members, select board members, including the town manager and assistant town manager, planning board members, and other committee and board members. It's a great honor to be here to present a proclamation from the governor of the Commonwealth, Charlie Baker, 
on our 400th commemoration and the signing of the Mayflower Compact. And it reads as follows. <clears throat> the Commonwealth of Mass, a proclamation. Whereas the year 2020 is a 400th commemoration of the arrival of the Mayflower Pilgrims and the establishment of the Pil Plymouth Colony in 1620, and whereas the deep time presence of the indigenous Wampanoag people has endured in their ancestral homelands for over 14,000 years and continues through today, and whereas the history of civic representation and governance in Plymouth has both indigenous and non-indigenous president and whereas in November 1620, the Plymouth colonists formed a civil body politic and established a tradition of electing representation government for the common good. And whereas through the ceaseless efforts of many, democratic representation now encompasses all citizens, regardless of race, ethnicity, or gender, including the women of America, who arrived the right, who achieved the right to vote 100 years ago, and whereas Plymouth Town Meeting reflects these enduring legacies and is a living embodiment of government by and for the people. Now, therefore, I, Charles D. Baker, Governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, do hereby proclaim October 17, 2020 to be Plymouth Town Meeting Day and urge all the citizens of the Commonwealth to take cognizance of this event and participate fittingly in the observation. Given at the Executive Chamber in Boston the 17th day of October in the year 2020 and of the independence of the United States of America the 244th by His Excellency Charles D. Baker signed by Karen Polito and Secretary of the Commonwealth William Gallon. Thank you once again for inviting me and I wish you all the best of luck in your, in your deliberations. Now it's my great honor to introduce the Governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Charlie Baker, to say a few words. Hey everybody, this is Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker. And the main reason I'm coming to you virtually today is to just say that we, like you, know that this year is very special, the Plymouth 400. And there was so much on the books and in the plans to celebrate, really in some respects, the founding of America. And I think for all of us um, who are all excited about the work that had been done by so many to tee this up as a very special and in many ways momentous and memorable occasion for everybody who would have a chance to attend, what a missed opportunity. But it all came um, to a grinding halt because of the arrival of the pandemic and COVID-19. And I just have to say that uh, the way people adjusted and the way people dealt with it all the way through both organizations was extraordinary. Uh, and certainly the opportunity to celebrate in a grand scale uh, what is in fact a grand and significant event uh, may have been missed, but let's face it, there'll be plenty of opportunities to talk about, celebrate, and discuss the history of what the landing at Plymouth has meant to this great country of ours. And frankly, in some respects, to the folks across the pond as well. And I'm sure we'll have a chance to do that. But for today, what I just want to say is I can't believe the way Plymouth stepped up to work with us to prepare what would have been a truly magnificent celebration. And I really hope at some point down the road, well, it can't ever be the same because it won't be 400 again, we get a chance to do something that truly is representative of what a major and significant milestone that really was and what it meant, not just for the people who are around now, but all those who came before us and hopefully all those that come after. You guys have a great time and a great meeting, and I'm sure we'll have a chance to celebrate at some point down the road. Oh God, creator of our world and giver of all good gifts, we ask your blessing on the town of Plymouth and on this assembly gathered for a town meeting. In these extraordinary times, we have special need of your guidance and wisdom. Help us always to put the needs of others before our own. Help us to be aware of the struggles of those whose lives are filled with challenges and remind us that the true value of a society is found in the way it helps those most vulnerable, those with the greatest needs. Help us to use our town resources in a careful, 
and responsible manner. And in these uncertain and challenging times, we conclude with a blessing shared by many different faiths. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May God's face shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord look upon us with kindness. May God grant us the gift of peace. Amen. Good morning, and welcome to this opening session of our fall town meeting. It's being held virtually Saturday, October 17, 2020. We're live at PAC TV studio, and we're continuing to make history as our Plymouth Town Meeting Legislature is being convened by remote participation pursuant to Chapter 92 of the Massachusetts Acts of 2020. Town Clerk Pearl Sears has advised me that we now have a quorum of at least 90 elected town meeting members, and I therefore declare that a quorum being present, this Plymouth Fall Town Meeting will come to order at 8.11 a.m. At this time, I'd like to invite all of us to take a moment of silence to remember town meeting member Brenda Bradley, who passed away following our last town meeting. Once again, Nicole Manfredi will serve as assistant town moderator, and today she'll be participating remotely. Nicole will now provide her opening remarks. Welcome, Nicole. Good morning. Um, I just wanted to let folks know that the help desk is available. The number is 774-773-6111. I'm also monitoring the chat, so if you have any questions or um, concerns with technology, just let me know and I can resolve your issues. Thank you, and that's Nicole Manfredi. She is the Assistant Town Moderator. And at this time, we welcome the Chair of the Select Board, Kenneth Tavares. Ken is on our panel. Uh, we'll bring him in uh, for his opening remarks. Good morning, Ken. Good morning, Steve. Mr. Moderator, town meeting members, elected and appointed officials, and fellow citizens. This morning, I address you as one of your select persons, and more importantly, as your neighbor. COVID-19 has been front and center in all of our lives and activities since March. We have heeded the advice and mandates of our governor and his staff. We have quarantined ourselves and taken on new challenges that we never imagined a year ago. I sympathize along with many in our town who are exhausted and want this crisis to be over and to just go away. As Plymouth residents, we appreciate all that the pilgrims endured their first winter along the shore here in 1620. Horrible weather, shortage of food, housing, and illness. After that cold first winter, they persevered. There is no doubt in my mind that we are going to prevail and overcome this virus. Why? Because we all come from good stock. And while we are working together unified, we will strike down COVID-19. Governor Bradford recognized that life has its ups and downs with great and small challenges when he wrote, and I quote, all great and honorable actions are accompanied with great difficulties and, most, and both must be enterprised and overcome with answerable courage. Your attendance today guarantees that the town's business will be done and done well. You have adapted to a new way of governing through technology and proved this summer that you can discharge your duties successfully. The select board continues to meet weekly to conduct the town's business. Soon, 20, the 2021-22 budget will begin its review as we prepare for a new fiscal year. Our town employees on all levels have proven that local government can function successfully under difficult conditions. 
first responders from public safety, medical, business, and school department staff are representative that the American can-do spirit is not lost. We celebrate our 400th commemoration in December, though different than originally planned. Nonetheless, we are proof that America's hometown still leads the way. The select board wishes you well as you deliberate today. Your service to the town is appreciated and well noticed. In the words of the great statesman, Sir Winston Churchill, never, never, never quit. May God continue to bless this great town of ours. Thank you and good morning. Thank you, that is Kenneth Tavares. He is the chair of the select board for the town of Plymouth. Now this morning, uh, since assistant moderator Nicole Manfredi is participating remotely, if there are no objections, I am appointing Plymouth resident Elizabeth Shanahan Jewett, who is PAC TV's director of outreach and communications. We're gonna go to her now uh, on the video. Uh, and she's gonna be serving today only as second assistant moderator. Elizabeth is here in the studio with me and she'll be providing backup support for Nicole as needed. And at this time, we are welcoming uh, Pearl Sears. She is our town clerk. She's gonna swear in the second assistant moderator followed by the town clerk's update on town of Plymouth voting. Uh, good morning, Pearl. Good morning, thank you. Elizabeth Shanahan Jewett, you know that you have been appointed as second assistant moderator. Do you solemnly swear that you will faithfully and impartially discharge and perform your duties as second, second assistant moderator in accordance with the bylaws and the charter of the town of Plymouth and the laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts? I do. You are so sworn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, town clerk Pearl Sears. And Pearl, since you are here, could you briefly update the town on the voting for the upcoming election? Absolutely. Um, as of Wednesday, we had all ballot requests out. That's over 18,000 requests that were mailed in a week and a half. Um, so I know a lot of people are wondering why their ballot is not checked in. Um, they've returned it in the box, the drop box out front, or they've sent it by mail. Um, we have thousands of ballots in the vault. We are starting to check them in. Our first priority is always going to be getting ballots out to the voters, but your ballots are safe, they're locked in the vault, and we're checking them in. The majority should be done by Monday. So check again on the ballot tracker on Monday, um, and if it's not there, give us a call. Thank you, and that is Plymouth Town Clerk, Pearl Sears. At this time, we welcome Kim Savory Hunt. She is chair of the Plymouth School Committee, and uh, Kim is gonna be providing us uh, with her morning message regarding the Plymouth Public Schools. Uh, welcome, Kim. Thank you, moderator Trifolati. Um, Good morning, everyone. Good morning, town meeting members, select board and committee members, as well as the Plymouth community. Um, first, I wanna thank all of you for your hard work and dedication to the town of Plymouth and your support of Plymouth Public Schools. We're so lucky to live in a community that holds such a high value of education. I want to send out a special thank you to the parents, guardians, and teachers. We know it's difficult um, for all of you. And while we work tirelessly every day to ensure that every student can succeed in this crazy time, uh, you're all on the front lines. And I know it can be emotional, frustrating, as well as rewarding. And your jobs are not easy. So we are all doing something that we've never done before. And I wanna assure you that there is no one that cares for and works harder around the clock for the students and teachers of Plymouth than this Plymouth School Committee and the school administration. In the midst of all this craziness, we've had a strong leader that has taken over as superintendent and risen to the task. We all know Dr. Maestas and he's done amazing things for our community and has left a great legacy. He's passed the tor torch to Dr. Chris Campbell who has taken the reins and shown us in the last few months how qualified he is to fill this position and support our students in an almost, said almost, impossible situation. We thank him for his leadership and dedication. I'm honored at this time to introduce to you Dr. Christopher Campbell, Superintendent of Plymouth Public Schools. 
Thank you, Ms. Savory, and thank you, Mr. Moderator, for allowing me this opportunity to address town meeting today. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to have the opportunity to greet you all this morning. Uh, as Ms. Savory said, my name is Chris Campbell, and I'm the new superintendent of schools. I've had the great pleasure of serving as assistant superintendent for the past 12 years in the community that I've had the pleasure of calling home for the past 21 years. I have three children, all students at the Plymouth Public Schools. My son is a recent graduate, and I have two girls in high school, a sophomore and a senior. I've had the great pleasure of understanding and engaging with our educational community, both as an administrator and as a parent. And there is no place I'd rather be than serving this great community as superintendent right now. I'd like to take an opportunity to thank several members of our community. First, thank you to our students and our families for your patience, your understanding, and your support. Our situation and constraints have evolved significantly, as we all know, over the last few months. Our students and families have faced great challenges, and they face these challenges with great courage and resilience. And I am so grateful for your strength and recognize these challenges have, have been evolving um, and they've faced them with, with great resolve. And thank you for your support and your understanding. I want to thank the many community members and partners and volunteers, whether it was organizing a team of volunteers to support our meal distribution efforts, donating thousands of bags to help us deliver food, or deliver Chromebooks to over a thousand families. Our community has always been there for us in our greatest time of need, and I am so grateful for that. I'd like to thank our Board of Health and our Director of Public Health for your valuable expertise, input, and tremendous support during these challenging times. We are so fortunate to have such great partners in our efforts to maintain student and staff, staff wellness, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I'd like to thank the Select Board for support you've provided me already as a new superintendent and for the great collaboration and support that you've shown our community and our district each and every year. And I'd like to thank our school committee for the countless hours and days that you have spent with me, our administrative team, and this community in preparation for our return to school. Your commitment to our students has been inspiring, and I am internally grateful for your support. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank you, our town meeting members, for your tremendous support that you have shown this district. The cost of reopening our schools under the current restrictions and regulations of COVID-19 have been extraordinary. If it were not for the overwhelming support of this elected body, I can only imagine what decisions we would have to make in order to meet the health, safety, and educational regulations and guidelines presented to us. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for their support. Now, planning for the FY22 budget will be one of the most challenging issues ahead of us. And these are extraordinary times, and we need to prepare for any forecast we receive. One thing that I've learned over these years, even as we advocate for essential needs, we are obligated to consider the economic climate and present a plan that is responsive to students' needs and to the community's ability to provide those needs. Particularly during these economic times, it's particularly important that we develop a budget that is responsive yet responsible. So lastly, I would just like to say um, I'm so very grateful for this opportunity to serve as superintendent of schools. As Ms. Savory said, these are challenging times, but it's the collective goodwill of this community. It's the collective support that I have received and that we all continue to receive that will get us through these challenging times. I wish you all a great day as you conduct the very important work of this community. And again, I thank you for this opportunity to address you. Thank you. Thank you. And that is Dr. Christopher Campbell. He is the superintendent of the Plymouth Public Schools. Also, thank you to Kim Savory Hunt, the chair of the Plymouth School Committee. This morning, we also welcome Mark Rich of Coltman and Page. He'll be serving as town council throughout today's session of town meeting. Welcome, Mr. Rich. Attorney Rich joins uh, me in the studio this morning, uh, along with Julie Thompson. She is the executive director of PAC TV. And we have Drew Chase and Samuel Franklin. They are representatives from OTI Technologies. Uh, today, PAC TV and OTI Technologies will be supporting our Zoom webinar platform and our V Voter platform throughout town meeting. Now, according to our town charter, Chapter 2, Section 5, Subsection 2, the town clerk keeps a record of attendance. And pursuant to the next subsection, a representative town meeting member who cannot attend a session shall provide written notice to the town clerk. Anyone wishing to inquire 
as to reasons given for town meeting absence should check with the town clerk. And I can report that a number of town meeting members have sent such written notice. In addition, pursuant to Chapter 2, Section 10, Subsection 2, representative town meeting members shall notify the town clerk in writing prior to the town meeting session as to any articles giving rise to financial conflict of interest. Town meeting members who are also reminded that the V voter platform includes an option to abstain if needed. Now, in accordance with Section 8A8, registered voters residing in the town wishing to participate in a remote town meeting shall submit a written request to the town clerk not less than 48 hours in advance of the town meeting. Upon receipt of the request, the clerk shall verify the requesting voter's registration status. And town meeting members are reminded that we have a live cable audience today. Once you've been recognized, you'll be unmuted with speaking privileges and also you'll be brought in on video and we ask that your video be appropriate. Town meeting members and officials on our panel are encouraged to identify yourselves by name and precinct or title each time you speak since some members of the cable audience may tune in at different times. Town meeting members are using the V Voter platform to request to speak unless a town meeting member has contacted me in advance and the town meeting members have been put on a speaker's list. When you wish to speak, please click on V Voter and you'll be added to the queue of speakers. The town officials attending by panel may be asked questions through the moderator. If you're called as a speaker on deck, please be prepared to unmute yourself and to come on video once your name has been announced. Now, today we are using the electronic V Voter system. If you experience a problem when voting, we ask that you click on V Voter for a point of order. But if your problem is with V Voter, then please call the help desk and report your point of order to the operator. You can also uh, communicate on the chat line through the assistant town moderator, uh, Nicole Manfredi. Now, the help desk is going to be available throughout each session of town meeting. If you have special needs or if you have a concern for which you do not wish to interrupt the meeting with a point of order, then please call the help desk and the attendant can then in turn communicate uh, to me through the assistant moderator. We request that when you speak, please silence all sounds where you are located to avoid distraction and interference with your audio and your video. Town meeting debate is directed through the moderator. All amendments to main motions are to be in writing. All procedural motions, whenever practical, are to be submitted in writing in advance. And I have received several motions uh, and they were sent to town meeting members yesterday. If you wish to accomplish something procedurally during the course of the meeting, do not hesitate to click on your V Voter application to make a motion or a point of order. We'll attempt to help you frame an appropriate motion or question that's consistent with either past press practice or with our parliamentary handbook, which is town meeting time. And town meeting time suggests that even if all the rest of the meeting knows the answer, it does no harm to review and restate a principle from time to time. Now, if an amendment motion contains a legal question or has legal ramifications, I may confer with town council, and such motion may be delayed until written and possibly researched. This past week, I received a number of motions, and uh, when needed, I did consult with town council, and some of the motions uh, were dispensed with prior to town meeting. So uh, that is the reason why it is important uh, whenever possible, and particularly now more than ever, with a virtual town meeting to submit your motions in advance. Residents who wish to make motions may do so through a town meeting member. Debate is encouraged. And if I've been notified in advance that you wish to speak on an article, your name's been added to a list of scheduled speakers. And I'll attempt to give everyone an opportunity to speak once before calling on a town meeting member another time. All speakers during this town meeting by remote participation will initially be limited uh, each time to up to three minutes in this time allotment includes question and answers. Town meeting members are reminded that while the moderator limits the scope of the debate, you limit the length of the debate. If town meeting wishes to close debate, a member may click on the voter and move the question. 
This motion is to close debate. It's not debatable. It requires a two-thirds vote. When the motion is received, we'll display the speaker's cue. As assistant moderator and moderator, Ms. Manfredi and I will be presiding throughout this virtual town meeting. We don't intend to become directly involved in the substantive discussion, but we are procedural facilitators to this legislative body and will attempt to be consistent and follow common sense. Now today, all the voting will be done electronically. A motion to change the order of the articles would require a two-thirds vote. A town meeting member who votes on the prevailing side of a motion may later move to reconsider the motion. And when a vote results in a tie pursuant to our town charter as the moderator, I may break the tie. We will recess within two hours from the start of the meeting as provided our town charter and will reconvene following the recess and proceed. You're reminded that a quorum is presumed and a town meeting member may question the quorum at any time. The return of the warrant of the fall town meeting shows that it's properly been served. If there are no objections, we'll waive the reading of the constable's return of service of the warrant of the fall town meeting. And further, if there are no objections, we will waive the reading of the warrant. Mr. Canty moves that all business in all sessions of this fall town meeting be commenced and conducted remotely by means of the Zoom webinar and OTI virtual voting platforms. It is a majority vote. Mr. Canty, do you care to be heard on your motion uh, before town meeting? Kevin Canty is the chair of the Advisory and Finance Committee. Good morning. Certainly. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good morning. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of town meeting, obviously we had a successful town meeting in August. Uh, and we are back again once again to do a virtual town meeting. Uh, I would encourage you to vote in favor of conducting this virtual town meeting, because even though we long to be back together again at Plymouth North in a physical format due to the rising numbers uh, with the virus that is not presently safe, uh, and the August town meeting I think went better than even some of the skeptics thought it would. If you would like to resume uh, having an in-person town meeting in the near future, which hopefully we will be able to do sometime in 2021. I would encourage you to wear a mask, practice social distancing, wash your hands, and follow the advice of doctors, scientists, and medical professionals, rather than those who believe they have a political or economic interest in downplaying the severity of a disease that has claimed the lives of over 215,000 Americans. Thank you. He is chair of the Advisory and Finance Committee. He is making the procedural motion uh, to have a virtual town meeting. At this point, uh, if there are no other uh, town meeting members who wish to speak uh, in connection with this motion, then we're going to go to the vote. And uh, the voter uh, will be setting up this vote. You'll see on the screen uh, it is shown here. Uh, we're going to give 30 seconds. Voting can begin now. Town meeting members are going to have 30 seconds to vote each time there is a motion. This will give us an opportunity uh, initially now to see how many town meeting members are going to be voting. Uh, they can vote yes, they can vote no, or they can abstain. Uh, this town meeting is coming to you live on Saturday, October 17. We are virtual. Town meeting members are participating remotely under a new enabling statute that was passed this year. The voting has ended. We will now have the totals. 103 say yes. Six say no to a virtual. Zero abstain. We will now go through the uh, precincts, uh, beginning with precincts one, two, and three, uh, then four, five, and six. The reds are the no's. Green are yes, and we don't have any abstentions. Uh, you'll see that town meeting voted overwhelmingly uh, to approve a virtual uh, annual fall town meeting. And we have now gone through all of the precincts and the motion does pass. Uh, we will now then move to our next motion, our next procedural motion. Mr. Canty moves that Article 7, 10, and 13 of the fall annual town meeting warrant be considered under consent agenda one, and that such articles be approved and acted upon as written in the warrant and as set forth in the report and recommendations of the Advisory and Finance Committee. 
This will require a two-thirds vote. Kevin Canty, on your motion for the consent agenda. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The following articles reviewed by those organizing this town meeting as being non-controversial, mostly housekeeping items, where it was anticipated there would be little, if any, debate or discussion. Putting them all on a consent agenda allows for them to all be included in a single vote, which it is hoped will provide more time for the debate and discussion of other articles at this town meeting. A small but vocal minority of town meeting members have expressed concerns about the practice of grouping any articles together, no matter what they are about, to be voted on as a block. The intention with this consent agenda, and all consent agendas, is simply to group only the articles that it is anticipated, based on the past experience and expertise of the organizers of town meeting, would both generate little, if any, discussion if they were voted on separately, and would be approved unanimously or nearly unanimously in separate votes were they to be voted that way. Town meeting members can still ask questions about these articles if they have them, can still debate them if they want to, and can even make procedural motions to remove articles from the consent agenda if they wish to do that. Grouping these items into a consent agenda has been done only to make the voting itself take less time. Saving time on votes in this manner may be less important in a town meeting with a short warrant like this one than in a more typical town meeting with over 30 articles, but it is still useful in familiarizing town meeting members with the consent agenda process so that in future meetings, time saved by grouping non-controversial votes can be instead devoted to debating complicated or controversial items, such as massive and costly projects or the annual operating budget, as examples. With that clarification and explanation out of the way, the included articles are the following. Article 7, which seeks to fund the town's portion of the plantings being done on the foothills preserve. Article 10, which seeks to amend a bylaw regarding the format in which departmental equipment is listed, and Article 13, which seeks to revise the Aquifer Protection District map. The Advisory and Finance Committee recommend town meeting approve each of these articles in unanimous votes. Thank you, uh, Kevin Canty. And on that prior virtual vote, uh, there was one additional one that was not received, uh, and that is Peter Connor. Uh, who voted yes. Thank you. Uh, we're now going to go discussion. We're going to begin with Catherine Holmes, Precinct 8, to be followed by Wrestling Brewster, Precinct 5. Uh, Catherine Holmes on the procedural motion. Uh, good morning. Welcome uh, to Plymouth Town Meeting. Bringing her in. Uh, all town meeting members are initially uh, participating as attendees and as we did on presentation night and on preview night, we are moving them to become panelists mm -hmm. when they speak. And uh, good morning, Catherine. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you, uh, everyone, uh, for taking time out of their busy lives to meet with us to participate in this really special form of government, uh, which allows the people of Plymouth to voice their opinions and make decisions that will affect all the people throughout our community really important work. Um, when we were challenged by COVID, we debated how we would meet to complete this work um, that we were elected to do. And many of us were concerned with a virtual town meeting and if it would work with the volume of participants and most importantly, take away from the, compl the collaborative nature um, that makes it so successful. Um, in, in this effort, we agreed at the spring town session that we consolidate several articles, as Mr. Canty had said, um, and that, that typically got approved in the past. Um, we agreed to do that because we weren't sure really what virtual format was going to achieve. But after that meeting, it was pretty clear that the virtual format did in fact work and work successfully, but with a couple tweaks that we know we needed to do. Um, I asked to speak on the consent agenda because I feel like we have proven that this format does in fact meet the needs to achieve our goals of town meeting. And we no longer need to consolidate articles. The, the consolidation of these articles are selected by the opinions of, the, of, of several people within our community. And they're not the majority of the town meeting members. So they're making an assumption that we, we wouldn't have an issue with it. And I think that's a dangerous place to start. 
Um, by continuing this practice, we're at risk of eliminating the ability to fully debate and understand the articles we're being asked to vote on. And many of the typical articles that, that we pass with no issue do so because of the historical discussions um, that have allowed us to, um, to get to that majority of vote and approval. So one of the areas that we need to improve on is the perception that we're in some great rush and that town meeting needs to, you know, to, we just need to get it completed. Um, there's a real perception that, there's, it's, that we're under some massive time constraint. The time to allow folks to vote has been reduced. As, and as the speaker times to, thir you know, to three minutes and the voting times to 30 seconds, which is a dangerous um, position, I think that we should be allowed to be able to talk on it. So I believe that this needs to change. We as a body have been elected by our constituents to do this work, and it's extremely important. We should not be hurried. Uh, the discussion and debate of these articles is a requirement for it to be successful. There are uh, only 13 articles, and several of them have no motion, no action. So we're not in a position where we don't have the time to actually thoroughly go through them today. So with that said, I'm asking you to vote no on the consent agenda. Thank you, Mr. Thank Moderator. Thank you. Catherine Holmes is Precinct 8. We're now going to go to Wrestling Brewster, Precinct 5. Uh, good morning, Mr. Brewster. Good morning. Thank you, uh, <coughs> Moderator. Um, I... I that he dropped out. Uh, so we're gonna go to William Abbott. He is precinct 12. And then we'll come back to Wrestling Brewster. Uh, William Abbott is also a town meeting member. And so uh, we welcome Mr. Abbott. Uh, we're bringing in town meeting members today from being uh, attendees to being panelists. We are also uh, subject to uh, operator error from time to time, as well as uh, town meeting members uh, having a good uh, connection uh, with their feed. And there's Mr. Abbott. Uh, Mr. Abbott, if you can unmute yourself, I can see that you're muted. Uh, welcome and good morning. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I just want to add a couple things to what Catherine Holmes said. Uh, she made the point about speed. Speed isn't of the essence. Also, the fact that there's only nine articles here out of the 13 they're acting on. The consent agenda might make sense if there were 30 or 40 articles. That's not what we have here today. But there's, but there's two other uh, considerations, two other points I want to make. The fact that an article may be unanimous is not the point. It could be a very important article that town meeting members could feel very strongly in favor of. It could be a unanimous vote, yet we still want to hear it at town meeting. The unanimity is not an issue. These articles, when you look at them in the warrant, they are masked articles. One of them has to do with a preserve across from Tidmarsh. Another one is a bylaw change. And the third one is a zoning change. Now, these are not, a, these are not routine articles that typically come up at the beginning of town meeting, like the receipt of reports. These are articles that somebody would see in the warrant and want to know what they're all about. Now, remember, um, Mr. Moderator, you know, we have a large audience. We are here doing the town's business. We are the citizens of town looking over our shoulders. They have no idea what these articles are about. Spend a few minutes on these three, artic three articles is absolutely essential. That's what we're here for. We're here to do the town's business in full transparency before the citizens of the town. And therefore, I urge that we vote no on this consent agenda. It should only be used in long town meetings with those couple of articles at the beginning of the town meeting, you know, all those what those are, like the receipt of reports, perhaps the payment of a, of a couple hundred dollars of bills from the previous year, but those are the routine articles, not these articles that should be heard and explained to those that are watching. Thank you. Thank you, William Abbott, Precinct 12. Uh, Mr. Brewster has canceled his request, and I do have a motion to close debate from Dennis Sullivan, however, um, I believe Mr. Brewster canceled his request uh, to speak, so I'm not going to take the motion to close debate. I don't have anybody else in the queue. We're now going to go directly to the main motion, which is the motion for the consent agenda. Uh, so we're going to show that on the screen, and we're going to, uh, there it is, to approve the consent agenda. Uh, town meeting members have 30 seconds in which to vote, and they will now begin voting now. 
and they have 30 seconds. This is the Plymouth Fall Town Meeting. It is coming to you live on Saturday, October 17. Uh, we begin with opening ceremonies at 8 a.m. and we will continue uh, for two hours, at which time we will take a short recess and then town meeting will reconvene. Uh, town meeting members are voting on a V voter platform. Uh, they are also participating through a Zoom webinar platform and voting has now ended on the consent agenda. And we have 33 voting in favor, 79 in opposition, zero abstention. The motion does not pass. We're going through the precincts. You see precincts one, two, and three. This is an opportunity for town meeting members. Even though it's not a close vote, we ask you all town meeting members to check to make sure your vote was recorded. Uh, if not, uh, please let uh, Nicole Manfredi know through the chat room or you can do a point of order in order to make sure that your vote is correct uh, as shown and that uh, if for some reason it was not recorded, uh, it would be shown uh, here. So again, uh, town meeting members uh, voted uh, not to approve that. Are there any other, if there are no other matters uh, to come before town meeting at this time, uh, we are now gonna begin uh, with Article One. And uh, uh, I'm gonna announce that Ashley Alexis Sullivan, town meeting member, voted no. And apparently her name uh, was not shown on the screen. So again, uh, also Bill Cohane voted no, he's in precinct three. So uh, if we can note those, and uh, again, uh, these are opportunities early in the meeting to try to um, correct votes. Uh, we're now gonna begin with Article One. Article One, we have no motion, we therefore have no action. Article 2A, Mr. Canty moves to amend the votes taken under Article 7A of the August 2020 Summer Annual Town Meeting in accordance with the attached spreadsheet as follows. Uh, and town meeting members, you have a spreadsheet and it's to increase by 15,000 the amount appropriated for fire department, all other expense, this amount to be funded from the fiscal 2021 tax levy. It's a majority vote. It will be a roll call. We'll now go to Kevin Canty. He is the chair of the Advisory and Finance Committee. Mr. Canty, on your motion. In a unanimous vote of 11 to 0 with no abstentions, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 2A. Approval of this article will increase the Fire Department's communication services line item for the current fiscal year by $15,000 to cover the $3,000 per month rental costs for the temporary trailer mounted communications tower. The old communications tower was considered a safety concern due to its very poor quality conditions and as such was dismantled prior to the hurricane season. This temporary tower is necessary to provide adequate communication services coverage to both the fire and police departments throughout town until a new permanent tower can be erected. Kevin Canty is the chair of the Advisory and Finance Committee. We are now going to go to a motion to amend. Uh, Catherine Holmes in Precinct 8 moves to change the funding source to free cast. This motion to amend will be a majority vote. It will be a roll call. Uh, again, welcome Catherine Holmes uh, on your motion to amend. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. So I, I am requesting that we change the funding source of this article so that the money can come out of free cash and not new spending which would have an impact on our taxes. I know that the volume is 15,000 and some would say, well, that's not a lot of money, but every single dollar counts to a lot of people, especially in this economic uh, uncertainty. Uh, we have over $10 million that are in the free cash fund uh, for those that are not familiar. Um, it was just uh, certified by the Department of Revenue so that we are able to use this money uh, for, this, uh, for this purpose. Uh, and uh, this money has already been taxed to our constituents. So there's ample amount to achieve this. The cost for the rental tower is not an ongoing operational expense. It's temporary. Um, it's a temporary charge that will end when the replacement of the completed tower is put in place. And, and I would suspect that we would do that once we have a solid plan that's designed and shared and accepted by a vote of town meeting. Uh, I ask you to uh, vote in favor of my motion 
uh, to uh, move the funding. Thank you. Thank you. When we do have a motion to close debate, it will first be on this motion to amend. We're going to go now to town meeting members. We're going to begin with Precinct 8, Donald Williams, followed by Precinct 12, Betsy Hall. Mr. Williams uh, will be brought in uh, as a panelist. Uh, welcome, Mr. Williams. Uh, and we are uh, debating Article 2A, both the main motion as well as uh, the motion to amend. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I don't see my face on there, but that's okay. Uh, this is a point of order, really. I, I'm wondering why we didn't vote on the uh, adjourned session of town meeting that would be held remotely on October 19th. Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, we are going to wait until later in the meeting. Uh, it was originally in your packet to be taken up early, but we are going to take it up later. We're going to determine um, the whether or not we need that time. Uh, but thank you for your question. And we're now going to go to Precinct 12, Betsy Hall. Betsy Hall, we're on Article 2A. Good morning, Steve. Good um, morning. I just have a quick question for, and good, good morning, all town meeting members and other uh, attendees. Um, I just have a quick question, and, and I don't know that Chief Bradley can answer this right now, but perhaps he can get that answer to us, or maybe it's Lynn Barrett. How much revenue does the uh, fire department uh, generate in a year, you know, annually, uh, through fees and however else the fire department generates revenue? How much revenue per year uh, is the fire department generating? Uh, we'll first go to Lynn Barrett. She is the director of finance. Uh, Lynn Barrett, good morning and welcome. Are you in a position uh, this morning to give uh, a response uh, to Betsy Hall uh, from precinct, uh, from her precinct, with respect to um, her inquiry regarding uh, the fire department. Lynn Barrett, good morning. Good morning. Um, so Betsy, according, I mean, that's a quick question. I just looked up in the system here for departmental receipts for the fire department. Um, last year took in, um, looks like approximately 154,000. The year before that was 178,000. And that's just receipts that go to the general fund. They do have other um, revolving funds that have specific receipts that go into those funds. But that's for the two years for general fund receipts only. Thank you. Betsy, any further questions or comments? Yes, so that money goes directly into the general fund to be used for any expense for the town, not for the fire department. Lynn Barrett saying okay, yes. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, Thank correct. you. Thank you. Um, we have no other uh, people on the speaker list uh, at this time for Article 2A that I'm seeing in the speaker's queue. Uh, and therefore, we will first take uh, oh, Alan Costello, Precinct 10. Good morning, uh, Mr. Costello. Uh, you care to be heard on uh, either the main motion or the motion to amend under Article 2A. Alan Costello. This is Plymouth Town Meeting. It's coming to you live on October 17th. We're bringing in town meeting members uh, from their attendee. 135 of them are in attendance, and we bring them in. Uh, there you are. Good morning, Mr. Costello. Uh, good morning, Mr. Moderator. Uh, a comment and a question. I'm actually in favor of the motion uh, put forth by uh, Precinct 8 member uh, Catherine Holmes. However, uh, during the past two weeks of caucuses, there was some confusion. I was wondering if someone from the town could explain what this additional $15,000 uh, for lease payments in conjunction with existing lease payments uh, does for the uh, lifespan of the temporary tower just so there's no confusion. Uh, Alan Costello, question will bring in uh, Fire Chief Edward Bradley uh, to respond to a question from town meeting member Alan Costello. Uh, good morning, uh, Chief Bradley, and welcome to town meeting. Good morning. When we originally um, leased the tower, we had to pay a fee for the tower to be delivered uh, from Oklahoma, and we also had to pay for the uh, fee to have it returned ahead of time and one month's uh, rental fee. Rental fee is $3,000 per month um, 
long as we kept it more than six months. If it was less than six months, it would be $3,500 a month. So the delivery had one month's fee. Then we went uh, and got a uh, reserve fund transfer from uh, the, the finance committee for six months because town meeting had gotten delayed from uh, April until August. This will now be add on another five months. So it will put in the operating budget enough money to pay the $3,000 per month lease through the fiscal year. Thank you. That is Fire Chief Edward Bradley. Mr. Costello, any further comments? Oh, I appreciate the answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any further discussion on Article 2A? I'm not seeing any other speakers. So we're now going to go to the motion to amend. Uh, and again, the motion to amend Catherine Holmes in Precinct 8 moves to change the funding source to free cash. Uh, this is going to be a vote, and people are going to be able to vote yes, no, or abstain. Uh, we're going to show the 30 seconds for the voting. This is on the motion to amend. You can start voting now. Town meeting members are voting on a motion to amend to change the funding source to free cash. Following this vote, there will be any further discussion, followed by a vote on the main motion. This is Plymouth Fall Town Meeting. It is coming to you live. Plymouth Town Meeting members voted earlier overwhelmingly to participate remotely. We do have three town meeting members at Plymouth North High School who are in the library using computers there, and they have tech support. Uh, the voting has ended on the motion to amend. We now have a total on the motion to amend. 95 say yes, 19 say no, zero abstentions. We now can vote on the motion, main motion as amended after we go through the precincts. We're showing all the precincts so that town meeting members can see uh, how they voted. Again, uh, town meeting members are, vote, are participating remotely at any location where they may wish uh, to be participating remotely. Uh, we are offering uh, technical support today. We have a help desk. We also have uh, students at Plymouth North High School assisting some town meeting members in that last vote. Uh, Lindsay Beristo voted yes. So if we can record her vote, that was a yes vote on that motion to amend. And at this point, we are now going to take up the main motion as amended. Town meeting members are going to have an opportunity again to vote virtually. We're going to show on the screen the main motion under Article 2A. Town meeting members can see that. We're now going to give them 30 seconds. Um, and before... I am seeing someone who wants to speak. I'm going to take a hold for one second. Uh, this just came up. Precinct 10, Peter Neville uh, has asked to speak on the motion. Let's bring Mr. Neville in. Um, and I'm also being told that Peter Connor voted yes. So we may want to check. That's the second time uh, that Mr. Connor has uh, needed to contact us regarding his vote. Uh, Mr. Connor, you may want to call into the help desk. Uh, to determine why your vote was not recorded uh, two times. Uh, but we're going to Peter Neville. Good morning, Mr. Neville. Good morning. Thank you for uh, taking this question. It sort of rose from other comments. Um, the first question is, um, what anticipated revenues does the chief see from uh, renting out space on the leased antenna? That would be my first question. And then the second question is whether or not those revenues uh, extend beyond the term of the lease. And I want to make sure I understand that the close of the lease will be um, June 30th, 2021, the end of the fiscal year 21. Um, and I guess lastly, where is this temporary antenna going to be installed? Um, will it be in a place that um, gives us some idea of reception and utility and future marketability for other revenues um, downstream. So those are my three questions. And um, thank you. Just we're, help, help me to understand a little bit. Thank we're going to bring in uh, Chief Bradley. He is the fire chief for the town of Plymouth to respond to uh, Peter Neville, uh, Precinct 10, or also uh, Bill Cohan, again, voted yes on that last. Mr. Cohan, if you and Mr. Connor would please call the help desk uh, in order that um, we can clarify your voting uh, technical difficulties. Mr. Bradley, 
Welcome again. The temporary trailer mounted uh, portable power was installed in June of this year. It sits in the front parking lot of headquarters fire station at 114 Sandwich. It was installed so that we could dismantle and take down the one that was damaged in the windstorms in March of 2018. With funding from the insurance carrier to pay for the dismantling of the other tower. The new one went up prior to taking the other one down. It can't even support all of the equipment that I need on a daily basis. So there is no room at temporary trailer mounted portable unit to take on any more space. Thank you. Thank you. Any further uh, questions or comments? Uh, if not, I don't see any other speakers uh, asking to be heard. So we're now going to go uh, to the vote. Uh, also, I'm being told Leonard Vaz uh, did vote no on the past three votes, uh, and he is working um, with us remotely from Plymouth North High School. Uh, so we'll call up the vote now on the main motion on 2A, and uh, we'll show that on the screen, and then we'll show the time that's shown on the screen. We're going to show 30 seconds. You can vote now. This is the main motion as amended under Article 2A. Uh, we have town meeting members voting remotely uh, on their V-Voter platform. Um, again, uh, anyone experiencing uh, technical difficulties is encouraged uh, to call the help desk, and the help desk number has been provided uh, to town meeting members uh, in order to be able to call uh, if you have a question um, regarding uh, the voting is ended, and we're now going to look at the vote uh, for uh, this 115 vote in favor, one no zero abstentions. Again, we're now going to scroll through the precincts and we want town meeting members to look. You'll see precincts one, two, and three all voted yes. And uh, we continue. Um, Lindsay Baristo voted yes um, on the last motion, she's being told. And uh, Nicole Manfredi is working on resolving her V voter platform connection. Uh, you'll see we're going through the various precincts and we see one no vote in precinct 15. So there are your totals. It's not close, but we want to check, make sure everyone uh, is uh, correctly uh, shown. And we're now going to go to Article 2B. We have no motion. Hearing no motion, I declare no action. Article 3, we have no motion. Hearing no motion, I declare no action. Article 4. Now in Article 4, the Advisory and Finance Committee uh, did take this up um, uh, as one initially. Uh, a number of town meeting members asked that we vote this separately. Uh, and so we will be doing that. Uh, in the last vote, uh, again, Leonard Vaz was a no. Uh, and I'm being told that uh, we now have a one-to-one -one, uh, tech buddy available uh, to Mr. Vaz uh, when he votes. So. We're now going to go to Article 4A. Mr. Canty moves the town appropriate the sum of $500,000 to pay costs associated with a public safety communication tower capital project, including all costs incidental or related thereto, and that to meet this appropriation, transfer $259,840 from the unexpended balance of the amount authorized by the vote taken under the following articles as indicated in the table below and $240,160 from insurance recovery over $150,000. I'm not going to go through the table. Town meeting members have received a copy of the table. It's a majority vote, a roll call. Uh, we will be taking uh, Kevin Canty, Chair of the Advisory and Finance Committee on Article 4A. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The Advisory and Finance Committee reviewed each component piece of Article 4 and then voted once on the whole article. As such, in a unanimous vote of 11 to 0 to 0, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve the following appropriations as listed in the report and recommendations book that all town meeting members have received. For A, the Fire Department Communications Tower. For B, the Fire Department Vehicle Lift System. 
4C, the Department of Marine and, and Environmental Affairs Herring Pond Watershed Study. 4D, the Department of Marine and Environmental Affairs' Engineering and Design for Dam Bypass at Jenny Pond. 4E, the Water Enterprises Manomet Zone Pipe Upgrades. 4F, the Airport Taxiway Echo Extension. And 4G, the Airport Purchase of NW-26 SRE Building. Due to the request of several town meeting members and an administrative decision by the moderator, which he has already spoken to, you will be taking separate votes for each of these component parts. He is the chair of the Advisory and Finance Committee. He spoke as to all parts of Article 4. We're now going to go to Precinct 10, Alan Costello, on Article 4A. Uh, Mr. Costello, uh, we want to welcome you back uh, as a panelist and uh, you will be being brought in uh, to us. And uh, meanwhile, town meeting members are reminded that uh, you can uh, participate uh, this morning also by calling the help desk, 774-773-6111. Mr. Costello, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, good morning, town meeting members. Uh, I'd like to speak to this article uh, we come at it from three or four different fronts. Uh, the first uh, uh, thing I think I should remind the group is that this, this article was before us just over two months ago at the uh, summer slash spring town meeting. Uh, and at that time, it, it did not get a favorable vote. Uh, it's here uh, back before us today with um, no changes in the uh, project or article. Uh, and this is what I like to address. Uh, I'd be in opposition of this article as it stands today um, on several reasons, but the key reason is that when it was first introduced to us last winter, prior to the pandemic, it had a component that there would be uh, an opportunity for some rental income. The town could derive some revenue from this uh, project, and it was an attractive idea. It was an idea, quite honestly, the town missed in 2014 when they put the first fire tower in place. Um, we've missed out on all that revenue. And I would, I would hope the town doesn't miss that opportunity a second time. But the proposed location put forth at the wastewater treatment is not a desirable location for second carrier tenants. There's a close proximity to the police tower at exit five and the county tower at the uh, uh, Camelot Park complex. So any high paying revenue from all of the cell carriers that we all use uh, would be non-existent. Uh, so it's, it's not very desirable in that respect. The second thing, uh, I forgot my thought, but uh, the second thing is that the other option that I think would be available to the town is there are private companies. And for full disclosure, uh, I own one of those companies, but I would accuse myself, but there's several companies out there that would take on a project like this, uh, develop the construction of the tower, site it, do all of the work for the fire, police, uh, DPW, let them use the tower at, at, at their will, at, the, at their desire, uh, at no charge, and that they would generate money uh, from rental income uh, to tenants uh, like Cellular One or uh, AT&T, Verizon, uh, you know, as a business. So this would be a $500,000 savings to the town and a revenue stream. So that's an option I think that uh, we should explore. And we've just given ourselves uh, the best part of uh, a year, uh, 10 months, with the uh, approval of the last article to uh, give us a, some breathing room to develop a project that's good for the taxpayer, uh, good for the fire department. Uh, you know, during this interim, the fire department is not without safe communications. This is a redundant system. Uh, and I think that the town has time to uh, methodically go through this, put together a project that's good for the taxpayer and the fire department, and I push for that. The other thing I want to address is, you know, I don't want to come across as an obje objectionist. I'd like to work with the town uh, in my capacity. I'm not an expert, but I've been in the field for 35 years. And in that, I've offered to donate to the town a communications shelter. Now, it's not a structure, but it's a shelter that Mr. they're going to- Mr. Costello, your time has expired. Do you need more time? Uh, Mr. Moderator, can I ask for one minute? Okay, one additional minute, Mr. Costello. We have uh, four other people that have asked to speak. Go ahead. Very good. 
I just want to wrap up that thought that there is an offer on the table that has yet to be picked up by the town management that I would like to donate a, a, a communication shelter to help subsidize this project, I would think to the tune of $100,000. The building was used by a national cellular phone carrier. It's set up to do exactly what the, what the fire department, police department would hope it would do. It's temperature controlled, it's safe, it's full electric. It has the ability for uh, backup electricity. It would be at least a savings when we go forth with the right location. Seconds. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to continue now with Everett Malagudi, Precinct 1, to be followed by Michael Leary, Precinct 2. Uh, we are currently debating Article 4A uh, on the uh, warrant. Uh, Everett Malagudi is being brought in. <coughs> Good morning, Everett. <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Trifoletti and town meeting members. Um, I have a couple questions regarding uh, this article. The first one is the uh, funding that was listed in the table that we received. Uh, one of the funding sources is through the, munis the Munis Capital Asset Software of 45,000 and change. When I was looking through my prior town meeting book for the April, the former April town meeting, that it stated that that money had already been used in encumbrances and there was a zero balance. So I'm wondering how we can use that 45,000 again when it's already been used. Why don't you ask all your questions, Mr. Malagudi, and then we'll take them. And the second uh, question that I have is, do we know a precise location on the wastewater treatment plant land that this potential tower would be uh, situated as I have talked in the past with the DPW as well as the uh, sewer department and there are other plans for the land and hopefully that the location of this tower will not um, deter those other potential projects from happening on that same parcel. Thank you. We're going to first go to Lynn Barrett. She's the director of finance for the quest first question on the funding and then to Chief Bradley on location. Lynn Barrett, uh, director of finance. Good morning. Good morning. So the Munis Capital Assets software on the in the book for the annual town meeting, it showed that it had been encumbered. We had um, we were working with a, a vendor, our current software company, um, Munis, and we, um, the product that they were going to supply to us was not going to fit our needs. So we abandoned that project. So that money became available. Chief Bradley Thank you. on the location. Uh, Plymouth Fire Chief Edward Bradley, uh, further responding to Everett Malagudi. And uh, Mr. Bradley, um, I think at this point we're going to go to Melissa Arigi. Uh, she is Plymouth Town Manager. Uh, if we can bring in Melissa Arigi, uh, further responding uh, to a question of Everett Malagudi. Uh, Melissa Arigi is our Plymouth Town Manager. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, Mr. Malagudi, we do not have a precise location. We know that we want it on the border of the property as close as we can get. And we also want to be cognizant of the fact that the DPW has talked for some time about the anaerobic digestion facility, which is, I think, what you might have been referring to for the future plans of the site. We want to be able to balance both of those. And we believe with the experts that we've met there, we would certainly be able to do that. In terms of using this communication tower as an additional source of revenue, one of the things that we do staff-wide is try and find additional sources of revenue for the town. We, um, we believe in going out to bid and finding locations for those cell companies that want to go on our water tanks, uh, flagpole that you all know downtown and some of those locations. But we really hesitate when you look at public safety communications tower. Now we've done it. We've been very successful at that at the police station, but that is not our primary purpose for wanting to build this half a million dollar communication tower. This is a very good site in terms of communication for fire and police and how they balance. In addition to that, half the revenues to pay for this are being paid by our insurance proceeds and that's all they can be used for. So we wouldn't exclude the ability or the thought process to look at potential companies, but we would wanna make sure that we captured all our space for public safety first. 
this town is just too large and you have too many demands to stick with a temporary tower for too much longer. Thank you, Melissa Riggi, Plymouth Town Manager, Everett Malaguti. Are you all set at this time? Yes, I am. Thank you. Thank you. We're now going to go to Michael Leary, Precinct 2, followed by Therese Brennan, Precinct 8. Uh, Michael Leary, uh, good morning to Plymouth Town Meeting. Uh, we're bringing him in uh, on a audio and video feed uh, from being an attendee to being a panelist. Uh, Plymouth Town Meeting is coming to you live uh, Saturday, October 17. Uh, we are at PAC TV Studios. We are remote throughout the town of Plymouth. We are at Plymouth North High School with a few of our town meeting members there with uh, tech support. Uh, again, Michael Leary, we're bringing in. Uh, he has no video. Mr. Leary, good morning. Yes. Um, I've been on the zone. Oh, this is Mike Leary, Precinct 2. You know, I've been on the zoning board approximately eight and a half years. We've heard four at least towers on this thing. And to be honest with you, one is I caution the town dragging this out. We do have half of it paid for. The other half, of course, we're going to pay for. Um, the other side of that coin is, on these four uh, towers we've heard, they always make space, repeater space, available to the town. I would like at the end of this to have Chief Bradley say if they've actually even used it. Because the other thing on this is I understand Alan's point of view, but the other side of this is it, their communication towers are so fickled uh, as far as their... Um, frequencies and things that actually even line of sight, you have, believe it or not, the white pines, the pine needles are the same length as some of the frequencies. So actually even pines make a difference. So some of these towers, one that we licensed, actually never got fulfilled. One of our board members, when a new tower was coming up pretty close to it, it actually got through the town them to move their uh, permit, if you will, over to the other tower because they couldn't even fulfill uh, that tower uh, having people rent off them. So I think we should go for a location that's good for us, worry about whether we can get people on it or not later. Um, if we go down the other road, we're going to be taking about two years, most likely, just to get it filled, you know, and, and then it might not be a location that's good for us. We might be just doing it for making money on it. So I, I tend to, I'm going to vote for the straight article. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I believe he asked uh, Chief Bradley to comment. Uh, again, Fire Chief Bradley, uh, if you heard uh, Mr. Leary, he was looking for uh, feedback from you. If we can bring in the Fire Chief uh, once again uh, to respond to Michael Leary. Uh, precinct two, yes. The question was regarding have cell towers in town. Yes, whenever they come in, obviously they need for uh, uh, there's been a couple of those towers that were uh, located in areas that would work for us for a remote receive site, not a main tower like this one, uh, and then they were never built. Uh, but we do have the ability to. Um, locate the uh, equipment on some of the sites. They don't all fit in to uh, our needs, but a few of these larger towers are, you know, close to the town border, which uh, doesn't give us a big bang for our buck because uh, we're projecting our signals into other towns that we're not you know, doing business. And um, some of them have other equipment on it that doesn't work with our frequencies. But we do look at every single one that comes in and space is offered and we can put up a receiver site on any one of them. They do start charging if you're putting any more than one um, uh, up as a receiver or, or a repeater. And of course, you know, we need the repeaters for both police and fire, uh, Department of Marine Environmental Affairs, the wardens, um, and uh, we even have the um, radio for the uh, bus company that does the uh, school bus in Columbus so that we have, uh, we're able to communicate with them when they're out on the road in case it was some kind of an issue. So it, it, it is complicated. We are working with um, our actually experts in the field and their Motorola uh, dealers, and they they then turn work with Motorola engineers and help us um, with all these uh, questions about you know, line of sight, frequency, 
uh, the area they need to be in to give us the best um, reception and things like that. But yes, we do look at every single one when they come in. Thank you. Um, that is Fire Chief Bradley responding. Did want to comment uh, earlier when we did not have video from Michael Leary, that is also a choice of town meeting members. And Mr. Bradley's audio uh, can be affected if he's getting notifications. Uh, it can pull back the video. Uh, we're going to go to Precinct 8, Therese Brennan, followed by Precinct 4, David Peck. Uh, we have two other people in the queue as well. Uh, we're going to go to Therese Brennan. Uh, she's in Precinct 8. Uh, good morning. Very soft. And if you could turn off any other sounds uh, that you have in your uh, location. Uh, again, we're participating remotely. Uh, good morning, Ms. Brennan. Hi. Go ahead. And you, we can hear you. We can also hear you. Uh, good, morning. good morning, Steve. Good morning, town meeting. Uh, I just want to agree with Mr. Leary. Um, I think we're really kicking the can down the road. Uh, if we reject this, we're not talking about $500,000. We're talking about $260,000 with the insurance payment. Uh, we do have a possibility to earn revenue if we build our own tower. And leasing from another company, in spite of what Mr. Costello says, does not allow us to earn any income. And it does not provide for the security that the, that the fire department and Chief Bradley uh, need. So I will be voting in favor of this. Thank you. We're now going to go to... Uh, that was Therese Brenning, Precinct 8. Going to go to Precinct 4, David Peck, followed by Precinct 15, Laurie Burgess. Uh, David, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my question is to Lynn and uh, town administration, in a way following up on Everett Malagudi's question, is, is looking at uh, the unexpended balance on a variety of things. I certainly welcome uh, budget creativity but I guess the question is, especially for some of the larger ones, why that amount of money is unexpended? I mean, we see vehicles several times. We see a snowblower. We see a $45,000 dump truck. Um, did, did the needs change? So we asked for it, approved it, and turned out we didn't need it. Or did, were they bid and they came in under bid? So it really is uh, commending um, budgetary uh, creativity, but also if we didn't really need it, maybe we shouldn't have asked for it a year or two or three or five years ago. So again, to Lynn and town administration, where um, uh, how come it turned out that significant amounts of money were not uh, expended? And then I'll just say I'm in favor of the article itself. I just want to inquire about uh, you know, where those sources of creativity came from. Thank you. Thank you, David Peck, Precinct 4, going to Lynn Barrett, Director of Finance. Ms. Barrett. Uh, good morning. So that laundry list of items that we're using, um, the only one that what the project was abandoned was the capital assets that I mentioned before. All of these other projects, the original amount, um, we used, we did the purpose of that project, the money was spent, the money that was left over was probably a combination of reasons of when it went out to bid, the bids came in lower. Um, you know, the departments, every department was interviewed with regards to all the articles that were on the Burke's Law. And as a result of the last meeting, where Everett had pointed out several articles that had been on there for a long time, we did um, Interview, we did meet with every department and reviewed every project to make sure that the project had been completed and to the satisfaction of the department. And these balances were remaining and could be used for other projects. So that's what we did. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go to Precinct 15, Laurie Hutchinson, followed by Precinct 13, Joseph Barron. Uh, on the last vote, Paul Hapgood voted yes. OTI, if you can... Pick up his vote, Paul Hapgood, yes, on the last. Uh, good morning, Laurie. Good morning, Mr. Moderator and town meeting members. Um, Laurie Burgess Hutchison, Precinct 15. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first is I'm wondering if um, the fire chief could speak to what the disadvantages are um, and what the risks to our public safety are of leasing the tower rather than building and owning our own. 
And uh, the second question is whether the proceeds from the settlement are available to the town if the communications tower is put on a site that's leased, that we're leasing. Thank you. Uh, we'll first go to uh, police fire chief, uh, Plymouth Fire Chief uh, Edward Bradley. Uh, Mr. Bradley, do you care to respond? I, I would defer that to with town manager. Melissa Riggi should have the better answers on all those. Thank you. Melissa Riggi is our Plymouth town manager. Uh, good morning, uh, Melissa Riggi. Thank you. So the insurance proceeds money will just sit and wait. It does have to go towards a new tower. It wouldn't be available for the rental. I hope that answered that portion of your question. And then I think the other question that you had is why we we're hesitant about leasing long term. Um, you might have heard Chief Bradley say earlier that the temporary tower um, isn't holding all the equipment he needs. So we just feel that a permanent structure is much safer and more reliable in a community of the size. Uh, if I could clarify my question. Yes, go ahead. Um, I, was, I was wondering, um, town meeting member uh, Mr. Costello had suggested that um, alternatively, we could, I guess, use a private vendor and lease that capacity um, rather than building our own tower. So my question was about that, whether what the risk is of relying on a private vendor for our fire safety communication. So I think some of the concerns for me, I mean, you can always try a bid that goes out to bid and said, is anybody out there interested in building us this facility? We thought about that with the anaerobic digestion facility, but they would get that priority space on there. Certainly they pro would provide public safety with space, but with something like this, it is more important that really the town and the public safety comes first. So that was our concerns about going out to um, bid to see if there's a company available that would build it for us. In addition, this should be on town property. This should be something that goes on town property. And that was a site that we identified based on, you know, we had our director of planning and development pull it out for us out maps of all available land. We looked at the geography, we looked at, you know, the winds, the height, and that was an ideal spot and you already own it. Thank you. And we'll now continue, uh, Precinct 13, Joseph Barron, followed by Precinct 10, Stacy Dela Cruz. Mr. Barron, good morning. Uh, good morning, Mr. Moderator, and thank you. Uh, good morning, town meeting members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak in behalf of this uh, tower, which I'm gonna vote for. Um, again, my history, 45 years in public safety uh, uh, outside of, in another community. Uh, 40 years as a firefighter. I just want to remind town meeting members that, that this is a safety uh, issue for every firefighter and every police officer. Uh, my early years in the de department, firefighters didn't carry uh, their own radio equipment. Neither did police officers. Uh, but history has shown, and uh, uh, NIOSH and uh, um, different studies on, on firefighter fatalities tell you that each firefighter has to have their own communication of device, and I'm sure it's the same for the police department. Um, they deserve to have a robust system that is controlled by your uh, public safety partners, uh, and uh, um, it, it's, it's just vitally needed. And, and uh, be mindful that these uh, your department heads have studied this extensively. Uh, they learn from the experience of uh, other departments. And uh, I just urge every town meeting to vote for this, particularly uh, in these difficult times for the safety of our police and firefighters. Thank you, um, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. And at this time, I actually have a motion to close debate. Uh, Daniel Gorsuch of Precinct 13 moves to close debate. Uh, we're going to show the speaker's queue. Uh, what I'm seeing in the queue here is uh, Precinct 3, William Cohen. I assume uh, Stacey Delacruz uh, may, was going to be called on next. Uh, we can remove Patricia McCarthy uh, since hers was also to close debate, as was Mr. Cor Gorsica. So uh, that is the queue. Uh, this is not debatable. It requires a two-thirds vote and we are now going to take a vote on whether to close debate. We will show it on your screen. 
uh, town meeting members can choose to terminate or close debate. Your voting begins now. You have 30 seconds in which to vote. This is as whether to close debate on Article 4A. We have a motion. Uh, town meeting members can uh, decide the length of debate on any particular article. Uh, town meeting members are continuing uh, chronologically with the warrant. Uh, we will be continuing for another uh, approximate 30 minutes, at which time we will take our morning recess. Uh, the voting is completed. Uh, it is now over, and we will now determine 89 say yes, 28 say no, zero abstentions. The motion carries by two-thirds. We have now closed debate, so we will now go on to the main motion uh, under Article 4A. We will call it up on the screen. Uh, it is a majority vote on the main motion. Uh, we will see uh, from B Voter uh, the uh, Article 4A vote. It is on the screen. We now have 30 seconds. Voting now. Town meeting members are voting on Article 4A, and it is the main motion under Article 4A. Uh, we will continue uh, with uh, town meeting uh, following this. We will show uh, the votes of town meeting members again. Uh, town meeting members are reminded, if your vote uh, does not show, please call the help desk. Uh, in addition to letting us know uh, about your vote, uh, the help desk 774-773-6111. That completes the voting on Article 4A. 90 say yes, 24 no, 1 abstention. The motion carries. You'll see precincts 1, 2, and 3. As we scroll through the precincts, we're seeing, uh, in some cases, people vote is shown or not shown. Uh, if they are either not here or not voting, uh, a green is yes, a red is no. Uh, the one abstention uh, will be shown as well uh, on the screen. Um, we have the color code on the votes. Uh, we are precincts 10, 11, and 12 and will complete, and you'll see a yellow on an abstention, precincts 13, 14, and 15. Uh, that completes Article 4A. We're now going to move to Article 4B. Uh, Mr. Canty moves the town appropriate the sum of 55000 to pay costs associated with the vehicle lift system, including all costs incidental or related thereto, and that to meet this appropriation transfer 14889 from the unexpended balance of the amount authorized by the vote taken under Article 23, 2017 Annual Town Meeting, transfer $40,110.54 from the unexpended balance of the amount authorized by the vote taken under Article 9A2, the 2018 Annual Town Meeting. It is a majority vote. Mr. Canty, on your motion, uh, you did make an initial presentation. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to add on any of these uh, following separate items? No, there's not, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. We're going to go right to the discussion. Uh, we're going to begin. Uh, Michael Leary has a point of order. I did notice when we scrolled through uh, that your vote wasn't recorded. Mr. Leary, how did you vote? Yeah, I voted yes. Mr. Leary voted yes. If you have any questions, uh, Mr. Leary, about the V voter call the help desk. Uh, any further discussion on Article 4B? I'm not seeing any speakers. Therefore, we will call up the vote under Article 4B. It will be a majority vote. Uh, town meeting has requested, uh, the number of town meeting has requested we vote each of these items separately under Article 4. Uh, Article 4B, your voting can begin now. Town meeting members are voting on Article 4B. Uh, this is coming to you live on October 17. Uh, we begin at 8 a.m. We will continue till approximately uh, 10 a.m., at which time we'll take a recess. Uh, town meeting will then reconvene. Uh, we are scheduled to continue throughout the day uh, today, and we will continue with the warrant. We are at the PAC TV studios this morning, also at Plymouth North High School, and town meeting members are remote at whatever location they would select. The voting has ended. We will now see the vote. 112 yes, 2 no, 1 abstention. Again, we will go and scroll to precincts 1, 2, and 3. You'll see are all yeses for those who did vote. 
Uh, again, Mr. Leary, um, I urge you to call the help desk uh, at 774-773-6111. Your vote was not recorded. Uh, precincts 7, 8, and 9 are now being shown. Uh, also, uh, again, uh, we're scrolling through the precincts, and precincts 10, 11, and 12. Plymouth has 15 precincts. Town meeting members are checking their votes. Uh, to make sure that they are accurately recorded, precincts 13, 14, and 15. And that completes Article 4B. Article 4C, and I'm being told, again, Ashley Alexis Sullivan voted yes. Ms. Sullivan, also, if you could call uh, the help desk, I would ask any town meeting member, when your vote is not recorded more than one time, uh, you may wish to benefit from the help desk uh, in order to work on your V voter platform. Article 4C, Mr. Canty moves the town appropriates the sum of $71,024 to pay costs associated with the Herring Pond watershed study, including all costs incidental or related expenses thereto, and that to meet this appropriation, transfer $71,024 from the Environmental Affairs Fund. It's a majority vote, and I have precinct two Richard Serkey speaking on the motion. We'll bring Richard Serkey in uh, as a panelist uh, so we can hear him and uh, see his audio. Uh, this is Plymouth Town Meeting. Good morning. It's coming to you live on October 17. Uh, and Richard good Serkey, morning, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Moderator. Go ahead. I have a, techni a technical question on Article 4C and it it's the same generic question that I have on 4F and 4G, which we haven't gotten to. The amount listed on the motion is 71,024. The amount listed in the original booklet was 81,024. And I certainly don't wanna look a gift horse in the mouth, but I just was wondering what caused the number to decrease. And similarly, with respect to 4F and 4G, uh, the amounts have decreased significantly from what was in the booklet to what's in the motion. So that, that's my question. So, Mr. Serkey, of course, uh, what's listed in the warrant uh, does not have to be the amount that's moved uh, by the Advisory and Finance Committee. I'll first go to Kevin Canty, Chair of the Advisory and Finance Committee. Uh, Mr. Canty, your motion is for an amount less. Um, Mr. Canty. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator. I believe the difference comes from um, this is the town's share uh, of, and that other funding sources are gonna be used to make up the total project costs, but I would defer, uh, and that's for all these items, but I would defer uh, further uh, clarification to either Lynn Barrett or David Gould or Tom Marr, respectively. Well, at this point, we're dealing with Article 4C. so. Uh, either, uh, I'll, I'll start with uh, David Gould uh, on Article 4C. Uh, he is the Director of Marine and Environmental uh, Affairs for the Town of Plymouth. Mr. Gould, good morning. Good morning. So the additional $10,000 will be contributed by the Herring Pond Watershed towards the project. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, at this time, uh, we're gonna go to Precinct 3 Richard Barberi, uh, I'm told that uh, Sam Butterfield, Precinct 4, voted yes on 4A and 4B. Did not record. Mr. Butterfield, uh, please call the help desk. Also, uh, uh, Alexis Sullivan voted yes on the last article. Help desk number 774-773-6111. We can provide technical support. Uh, and at this time, we're inviting Richard Barberi Good morning, Mr. Barberi. Good morning, Mr. Waterator. Thank you. Richard Barberi, Precinct 3. Since the town, um, since the Herring Pond is in two towns, Plymouth and Bourne, are we going to be uh, testing the waters in the Bourne portion of the pond? And if the problem is found that it's on the Bourne side, are we going to, how are we going to address that? Is Bourne going to kick in some money or is Bourne just going to say thank you for the study? Uh, David Gould is the Director of uh, Marine and Environmental Affairs for the Town of Plymouth. Mr. Gould. So that's a good question. The watershed is based, though, that Bourne is at the lower end of the watershed. So we'll be looking at 
um, the contributing factors into the water bodies that we're concerned with, which will be Little uh, Herring Pond, Cartage River, and Great Herring Pond. Um, Bourne being at the lower part of the watershed um, isn't really an issue for us because, because we're concerned with getting into uh, the three water bodies that I just listed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. For, further discussion, Article 4C. Uh, if not, we'll go for a vote. And uh, at this time, we're going to be voting on Article 4C. Uh, before we do, I have one more uh, town meeting member, Precinct 8, Don Williams. We'll bring Mr. Williams back in uh, to uh, speak on Article 4C. Uh, Don Williams, good morning. Uh, I'm told it's being taken a minute to bring him in. Again, the help desk number 774 773 6111. We're bringing in town meeting members from uh, their position as panelists on the Zoom webinar platform, and we're moving them uh, from attendees uh, to panelists so that we can hear them and see them at the same time. Good morning, Mr. Okay. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, town meeting representatives, for all you do. I'm here, uh, full disclosure, I'm the president of the Herring Ponds Watershed Association, and we have raised $10,000 uh, to abet this effort. We are doing it because this year there are 10 ponds that are affected by cyanobacteria blooms. They are, Great Herring Pond is the largest of these. It's the uh, first time in history that people have remembered that we've had it. So we're concerned about the property values. We're concerned about people's health. We're concerned about the aquifer and its health. So what I want to do is raise three points as to why this is a, a good idea to do at this time. Number one, it'll save money, and I'll get into that. Number two, it will likely improve water quality uh, for everybody. Number three, the knowledge base that we will gain will prevent other ponds from having this problem, I'm hopeful. So... To address a question raised by Christopher Houle in, a, uh, in the presentation meeting, Christopher asked why we weren't doing bids on this process. Um, we're going to UMass Dartmouth to do it because they know our pond. Uh, the bids are not necessary because they're a state organization. And finally, the, um, the SMAST is a lot less expensive uh, you'll recall that the Bartlett Pond cost of a watershed study was $180,000. We're asking for a total of $80,000 to do much the same things, and we've had experience with this group. The water quality plan pinpoints the causes and suggests solutions for the causes to these blooms, not only the, uh, algae, the cyano bloom, but also the algae bloom. And that's, that's very important, and we think it's so important that we've contributed $10,000 to defray the cost. Finally, it put, and most important probably, it puts Plymouth at the top of the list in getting grants to do the bucket and shovel work. And we know from experience that, say, runoff projects are sometimes a half a million dollars each, and this would save uh, all of us a lot of money if we uh, get grants for this. So 30 seconds, the water, the, the, I'm going to need a little bit more time. I, I will move quickly. How much more time, uh, Mr. Williams? I need another minute. OK, go ahead. The water quality, it would be great to have no more blooms and no more algae because it lowers the chance of aquifer pollution and gets people into the ponds, which is good. Finally, knowledge base is increased. It would be fantastic if we can find, get behind other ponds to help them solve that problem. It suggests steps to reduce it. And actually donations were received from people outside the watershed. So they realized the, uh, and, uh, the, uh, the universal appeal of, of doing something like this. So I, I urge you to vote yes on Article 4C. This is a good investment for the taxpayers of, of Plymouth. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any further discussion on Article 4C? Uh, if not, we're going to move to a vote on Article 4C. It is a majority vote. Uh, we'll call it up on the screen. Uh, you'll see it now here. 
We're going to give 30 seconds. Voting can begin now. Town meeting members are voting on Article 4C. On the warrant, we're taking each of the items onto Article 4 separately. Uh, town meeting members are voting each separately. Uh, we'll have a vote uh, shortly, and when we complete uh, the 30 seconds of voting, this is Plymouth Fall Town Meeting. It's coming to you live on Saturday, October 17. We began at 8 a.m. We will be recessing uh, shortly. Uh, town meeting members are moving through the warrant. They have completed the voting on Article 4C. The totals will be shown 111 in favor, 5 no, 1 abstention. It carries. We will now go through the precincts. Uh, they are being shown on the screen. And while they're being shown, I will read the next article into the record. Uh, article 4D. Mr. Canty moves that the town appropriates the sum of $75,000 to pay costs associated with the engineering and permitting for dam bypass at Jenny Pond, including all costs incidental or related expenses thereto, that to meet this appropriation transfer 75,000 from the Environmental Affairs Fund. This is on Article 4D. It is contained in the warrant. Uh, we heard the presentation from the Advisory and Finance Committee, which was for all of Article 4. We're not seeing anyone requesting to be heard on this, but yes, we're going to go to Precinct 1, Everett Malagudi. We'll bring in Everett Malagudi as a panelist uh, so that he can be heard on uh, this particular item of Article 4D. Uh, town meeting members are participating at this town meeting not only with audio, but with video and we're bringing them in uh, each time they want to be heard uh, to speak on a motion. Uh, Everett Malagudi is a town meeting member in Precinct 1. Uh, town meeting members uh, will continue to debate until all speakers have been recognized or there is a motion uh, to close debate. Uh, town meeting uh, began uh, this morning uh, with opening ceremonies, uh, and they were followed by some votes from town meeting uh, to approve a virtual town meeting, but not to approve a consent agenda. Video is not with Everett. It's just audio. So we don't have video this time with Everett. We <laughs> have audio. Again, these things can happen. Uh, good morning, Mr. Malagudi. Good morning, Mr. Trifoletti. Um, I just have a quick question on this, and it doesn't actually pertain um, to the um, article itself, but to the funding. Um, I just would like to know how much is remaining within the environmental affairs account and um, how much would be left over after all the articles um, present are accepted from it would be left over. Uh, we'll go to Lynn Barrett, uh, Director of Finance. And uh, as I understand the question, not only how much is in it, but how much would be after the articles, assuming the articles were all voted favorably uh, with the motions. Uh, Lynn Barrett is the Director of Finance uh, responding to a question uh, from Everett Malagudi of Precinct 1. Uh, we're going to go to uh, Lynn Barrett now. Good morning. Good morning. So Everett, there's approximately $220,000 available in the Environmental Affairs Fund. Um, so, I mean, I haven't added up each one of these, but you can figure it out, I guess. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Lynn. It's kind of, uh, Ms. Malgudi, we don't have the vote yet on all of them, but uh, as she said, you can do the calculations uh, after further discussion on Article 4D. I don't see any other speakers. We're going to go to the vote. Uh, it'll be shown up on your screen. We have two uh, people from the voter supporting us. There's the vote. We're going to put 30 seconds uh, for your timing. You can now vote on Article 4D. Uh, town meeting members are voting on the main motion under Article 4D, and we will then continue with Article 4E. We are taking each item separately uh, on the Article 4 uh, items. Uh, town meeting member are continuing uh, to uh, deliberate and debate uh, by remote participation uh, at this town meeting. Uh, we are working with a V voter platform and with a Zoom webinar platform that completes the voting on this particular article, 4D, and the results, 116 in favor, one no, one abstentions. We're going to scroll through the precincts 
Town meeting members are encouraged to check to make sure that your vote was properly recorded. And while we're going through the precincts, I will read into the record Article 4E. Mr. Canty moves the town appropriate the sum of $5,100,000 in paid costs of the Manomet Zone Pipes upgrades and for the payment of all costs incidental or related thereto and that to meet this appropriation, the treasurer, with the approval of the select board, is authorized to borrow $5,100,000 under and pursuant to Chapter 44 of the General Laws or pursuant to any other enabling authority and to issue bonds or notes of the town, therefore, and further any premium received by the town upon the sale of any bonds or notes approved by this vote, lest any premium applied to the payment of the costs of the issuance of such bonds and notes may be applied to the payment of cost approved by this vote in accordance with Chapter 44, Section 20 of the General Laws, thereby reducing the amount authorized to be borrowed to pay such costs by a like amount, and further said total sum, which shall be reduced by the amount of any grants received by the town pursuant to General Laws, Chapter 44B, Section 11, General Laws, Chapter 44, Section 7, or any other enabling authority. This is a two-thirds vote. Uh, for the town, and we're going to begin with Precinct 5, Wrestling Brewster, who was asked to be heard on the motion. Uh, Mr. Brewster, good morning. Uh, as we bring you in uh, as a panelist, uh, go ahead. Hi, good morning. Uh, Wrestling Brewster, Precinct 5. Um, during the COPC meeting uh, recently, uh, it was brought up that where the funding would, would this be coming from. And it was said that the wouldn't go on the tax roll, but be put to the um, ratepayers. And I just wanted to clarify that for um, town meeting. If Lynn could talk about where, where that money is going to eventually come from. Question from Wrestling Brewster, Precinct 5, to Lynn Barrett. She's the director of finance who will be responding to the question. Good morning. Good morning again. Um, so the Manomet pipe upgrades would be a water enterprise fund project. So the principal and interest associated with that project would be incorporated into the annual budgets of the water enterprise fund. Um, and this project can fit into their um, debt service budget which um, on average um, is between two million and two and a half million a year. So we fit their capital needs into their debt service, um, into that area in their budget. And this project would probably go long term um, if you vote it now in fiscal 2024, I believe. Okay. Thank you, Lynn Barrett, is Director of Finance, Mr. Um, Rudolph. So, so the didn't really answer my question about that would go on the rate payers, not on the taxpayer, correct? Yeah, water enterprise fund as definition is paid for by the water rates. There is no general fund subsidy. The water enterprise fund is self-sufficient. Mr. Brewster, do you understand? Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. I, I, no, I just wanted to clarify that, thank you. Okay. Thank you, we're gonna go to precinct 10, Peter Neville. Uh, we are uh, discussing Article 4E. Uh, Peter Neville uh, is in Precinct 10. Uh, he's asked to be recognized, which tell me, good. Hello, Mr. Neville. Good morning, and thank you for putting me on. I just want to uh, say kudos to the uh, staff uh, in response to my question, which was similar to wrestling's, uh, who pays for this? And they referred me to a draft water system master plan at the town's website, um, which was done in November of 2019. It's 365 pages long, and I won't tell you I read the whole thing, but I did go to pages 178 um, through 181, which identify the capital improvement summary uh, phases one, two, and three. And uh, just to reinforce uh, what wrestling found out with this question, this is a water enterprise fund revenues would support the, the um, basic improvements that are well substantiated within the report. And so the recommendations have broken out um, three phases, um, 2020, 2025, 
2026 to 2030, 2031 to 2035. And those recommendations uh, spoke to my question, if we spend 5 million now, what's coming down the road? And there it is. Um, so phase one, we're looking at 5 million now, but there's a total of 21 to 29 in phase one. In phase two, there'd be another 26 million. And in phase three, it would be at 10 million, nine or 11 million. I just want to say that um, sometimes I think that the, the town flies uh, by the seat of its pants and uh, doesn't necessarily do the research to warrant the decisions that are made. And I've been proven uh, a fool in this case. Um, this is just a fantastic report. Uh, there's obviously a lot of science and good data. And so kudos to staff and thank you for being so responsive to my questions. I'm gonna vote in favor of this. Thank you. Precinct eight, Therese Brennan, followed by precinct one, Everett Malagudi. And we are debating uh, in our warrant article 4E. Uh, we're gonna invite Ms. Brennan back uh, once again as a panelist uh, to speak at town meeting. Hello. Hello, Steve. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I would like, uh, could we ask Mr. Beter to speak uh, about the economic adjustment grant, which I believe is still available for this project? It's a significant amount of money. Um, that's it. Thank you, Jonathan Beter. He is the director, Department of Public Works, uh, and he'll be speaking in response to a question uh, from town meeting member uh, Therese Brenning. Good morning. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, so the question is, is there, are there, were, are there any grants available for a project like this? We, we have been working with the, um, the federal uh, agency for economic uh, development assistance grant with the closing of the power plant. True. We spoke, we started speaking to those folks a couple of months ago um, regarding this type of project and it, it would qualify. What happened was because of the postponing of town meeting in April um, out into the summer, we, we, we missed the deadline if you would. But we did speak to them and we will reapply. I can't guarantee that we will get it because there is a jobs component piece, um, especially that since this project is in Manomet. But we do have some support that we've heard from the agencies involved and we will be applying as soon as this, if town meeting votes this appropriation today, I will be on the phone with them early next week to, to see if there is some um, ability for us to move forward in that regard. Thank you, Jonathan Beter, Director of Public Works. Ms. Brendan, does that complete a response? Yes, it does, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Th Beter. Thank you. Uh, Everett Malagudi, Precinct 1, followed by Leonard Vaz, uh, Precinct 1. Mr. Malagudi, uh, go ahead and speak. Thank you, Mr. Trifoletti. So I have um, two questions on this and I brought up one of them during our caucus. Uh, so the first one is the 5.1 million, is that going to be um, borrowed all at once or is that gonna be borrowed in phases for this project? And the second one, like what uh, we did during the water meter replacement program where the um, old meters were scrapped to recoup some value on that. Would that be the same principle for the uh, cast iron pipe in this scenario? Lynn Barrett, Director of Finance, responding to Everett Malagudi on the borrowing. As far as borrowing on this project, similar to other projects, is as they need the cash flow for the project, we'll borrow the money. Um, that's why I said, we probably won't go long term until the project is completed and um, and then only based on the amount of money that they need. For example, um, the Forges Field project came in under bid. So we didn't borrow that whole amount. We only borrowed what they needed based on the cash flow requirements of the construction project. And uh, Lynn, did you want to answer a second question? Um, I'll let JB answer the question regarding the pipe. Jonathan Beter is the Thank director you. of the Department of Public Works. Uh, Mr. Beter, if you could further respond. Uh, good morning. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Again, this came up at the Committee of Precinct Chairs meeting. Everett asked the, that exact question. We gave a response then. Um, it's not feasible to scrap the pipe in a project like this. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Malagudi, you all set? Thank you. We're going to go to Hello. Leonard Vaz. He's in Precinct 1. I believe Mr. Vaz is at Plymouth North High School. 
Uh, good morning, Mr. Vaz. Uh, if the tech buddy can help with the uh, move of the screen. Uh, go ahead, you're recognized. Yeah, good morning, Steve, and good morning, town meeting members. Here we are, 90 days or less that this was turned down, and now they're back again. Like the old uh, adage, that if at first you don't succeed, try and try again. Now, I am not against people getting water and, and water projects. Why, why do we have to go for the whole enchilada all the time? Why can't we come say I, a million dollars and we're going to do phase one or two million dollars phase one or whatever it takes and do a portion of this and come into a future town meeting and ask for more money to do the second phase? We always have to go for the big number and the taxpayer has to dial out some more money. Thank you. I Thank am you. going to vote no. Thank you. Precinct 4, Samuel Butterfield. Uh, further debate on uh, Article uh, 4E. Good morning, Mr. Butterfield. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. And good morning, town meeting members. I just have a quick question for JB. And that is, uh, could you speak to the condition of the existing pipe system and uh, whether or not it's... Uh, on the verge of failing or anything like that? That's my only question. Jonathan Beter, Director of the Department of Public Works, responding to town meeting member Samuel Butterfield on Article 4E. Uh, Mr. Beter, welcome back. Yeah, yes, Sam. Many of those pipes were almost 100 years old. They were all cast iron. We're witnessing severe tuberculation. And, and what the issue is in Manomet is, you know, we have severe restrictions in those, in those pipes causing flow and pressure problems. It's hard to fill the tanks, it's hard to move water. So those restrictions are due to the aging pipes. I wouldn't say they're gonna fail, um, but there's a strong probability of, you know, them losing their, their interior diameter size, which is, which is a problem for us in terms of supply. That's why we're here uh, requesting this project be approved. Thank you. Uh, Actually, if I could ask a follow up. Go ahead, go ahead, Sam. Uh, just a follow up, but I, I would assume too, JB, that it, with newer pipes, and without the following that's up probably in the lining of the pipe of the existing system, there would be some savings in terms of energy costs for pushing that water through the system. Yes, absolutely. So the, the pipes we would use today are cement line, ductile iron. So we'd be increasing the sizes of all those mains, which would provide more volume, better pressures for all the residents, especially when it comes to fire flow. And it would help us give us an ability for pH control so there'd be a savings in terms of pumping with energy and chemical costs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Patricia McCarthy, Precinct 5, moves to close uh, debate. It is not debatable. We'll show the queue. We do have one uh, town meeting member who wanted to speak again on uh, this article. Um, so there you are with the queue. We'll take off Patricia McCarthy. Here's the motion. Uh, one wanted to speak. We're now going to vote on whether to close debate under Article 4E, um, and this is a procedural vote. It requires two-thirds. We'll show it on the screen, uh, and it is going to show that you can vote uh, yes, no, or abstain on a motion to close debate, and town uh, meeting members will be voting that uh, when it is shown. There it is, and we're going to give them 30 seconds. Voting begins now, and we're going to be voting. This will be the last vote. Uh, before um, we vote on a main motion. Um, and if it is not successful, we'll continue to debate. If it is successful, we would then go to the main motion. Um, so we are currently debating, uh, voting on whether or not to close debate on Article 4E. And the voting will end uh, as we count down the clock. Uh, it requires two thirds. Uh, town meeting members are now voting. 93 say yes, close debate. 21 say no, zero abstentions. The motion carries. Uh, we're not going to go through the precincts. It's a procedural vote. Um, it is not close. Uh, so we're going to go right to the main vote now uh, because we're going to go to the substantive vote, um, and that we will go through the precincts. So now we're going to do the substantive vote on the main motion, Article 4E. And uh, again, uh, this will be a two-thirds vote and people have 30 seconds in which to vote. 
Voting begins now on Article 4E. Uh, it is a vote uh, to appropriate the sum of 5100000 uh, Following this vote, uh, town meeting members uh, should know we have 120 attendees. Again, town meeting uh, members are setting records uh, for participation uh, at both the summer and now the fall uh, town meeting, uh, which is being conducted by remote participation. We'll be going uh, to a recess upon uh, completion of the vote and as we scroll through the, uh, the precincts, uh, the results, 94 say yes, 22 say no, zero abstention, the motion carries by more than two-thirds. We're going through the precincts. We're starting with one, two, and three. In Plymouth, we have 15 precincts, precincts four, five, and six. We're going to continue seven, eight, and nine. All the precincts will be shown. Town meeting members are checking. 10, 11, and 12, and we'll finish with precincts 13, 14, and 15. And as we do that, we're going to take a short recess. Uh, this session of town meeting is in recess at 10.05 a.m. Thank you. Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone back from the morning recess from Plymouth Fall Town Meeting. This is coming to you live on Saturday, October 17. We are at PAC TV Studios. We're also at Plymouth North High School. You saw a town meeting member recently zooming in from the high school. Also, town meeting members are also at their homes or other locations uh, participating remotely. Uh, at this time, I'd like to uh, invite all of you to join me in wishing town meeting member Ken Howe, a happy 90th birthday, which is forthcoming on November 23rd. I'd also like to thank all who participated in the opening ceremony. We want to thank the new Plymouth Guard, Steve Matern, John Lydon, Charles Votrain, who's also a town meeting member, John Morse, uh, Jean Dunn, there was one other uh, woman uh, who participated, uh, thanks to her. And also special thanks to uh, also a reenactor, Stanley Wallman, who provided me with the uh, pilgrim attire uh, that I wore in the opening ceremonies. Our appreciation is extended to Sonia Abdel Fatah, a junior at Plymouth South High School. She performed the national anthem. We certainly want to thank State Representative Matthew Muratori, uh, and also Governor Charlie Baker uh, for their celebration of Plymouth's 400th anniversary. This morning, uh, we have appreciation extended to Father John Collidy, and uh, he is... Live TV, and I now have my microphone on. Uh, we also express appreciation uh, to Father John Collidy from St. Mary's Parish uh, for his participation uh, in the town meeting and for offering uh, the invocation. Uh, and at this time in the town meeting, we're going to continue uh, with Article 4F. And uh, Article 4F is on our warrant. Uh, and we have a motion from Mr. Canty. Mr. Canty moves the town appropriate the sum of $100,000 to pay costs associated with the Taxiway Echo Extension Capital Project, including all costs incidental or related thereto, and that to meet this appropriation, transfer $60,000 from the unexpended balance of the amount authorized by the vote taken under Article 9A18, uh, 9A, uh, in the 2019 annual town meeting, relocate Sierra Taxway, Taxiway, transfer $22,252 from the unexpended balance of the amount authorized by the vote taken under Article 4A of the 2019 uh, fall annual town meeting and relocate the Sierra Taxiway and transfer $17,748 from airport retained earnings. It's a majority vote. Mr. Canty has spoken to it. Uh, we can have any question answered uh, by Thomas Marr, 
He is the airport manager. Uh, we're not seeing any town meeting members uh, wishing to speak or be heard on this. Uh, and absent any request to speak, uh, we are going to go uh, to uh, the vote. And uh, at this time, I'm going to call on the screen uh, for the vote under Article 4F. Uh, town meeting members have resumed uh, from the morning recess. They'll have 30 seconds in which to vote under Article 4F. We'll show the clock. Uh, it will then uh, begin to record the time. If voting begins now, town meeting members are voting on Article 4F. Again, uh, when we returned, I my um, microphone was not on. So again, for those of you who didn't hear, we wish Ken Howe a happy 90th birthday. He's a town meeting member. He's B90 on November 23rd. The New Plymouth Guard, Steve Matern, John Lydon, Charles Votrain, John Morse, Gene Dunn. Special thanks to Stanley Wallman uh, for providing uh, pilgrim attire that I wore. Uh, Sonia Abdel Fatah was a junior at Plymouth South High School performing the national anthem. We're now going to look at the vote, uh, and the vote is 105 in favor, 7 no, 2 abstentions. We're now going to scroll to see if how the people voted again uh, in the opening ceremonies. Also, we want to thank uh, Governor Charlie Baker and State Representative Matthew Miratori uh, for participating uh, in the Plymouth 400th anniversary and Father John Colledy. Um, so if we could... Uh, continue and look at uh, the voting of town meeting members uh, on Article 4F, and uh, we're going to continue uh, as we go through this. And uh, I did have see now a speaker coming in late, so we're going to be moving on to Article 4G. Mr. Canty moves the town appropriate the sum of $40,000 to pay costs associated with with purchasing building Northwest 26 for the storage of snow removal equipment, including all costs, incidental or related expenses thereto, and that to meet this appropriation, 40,000 be transferred from airport retained earnings. Again, a majority vote. Uh, I am first going to go to Precinct 11, Ken Howe. I'm not sure if Ken wanted to speak on this article, uh, but um, we're gonna go to Ken Howe. Uh, he is with Precinct 11. We'll bring him in, followed by Precinct 3, Dale Weber. Uh, we're first going to go to Ken Howe, uh, and Kenneth Howe is the town meeting member uh, who has also got a big birthday coming up. Uh, good morning, Kenneth Howe. Uh, we're bringing you in. Do we have uh, audio and video from Mr. Howe? Uh, I understand we have audio. Uh, Ken Howe, if you want to begin speaking, go ahead. You can speak. Go ahead, Ken. Good morning. Yeah. Good morning. We can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Good morning. Yeah, I'm uh, getting a little lost there, uh, Steve. I got a lost the button I needed to, to uh, get on the program. I'm back with you now, I think. Okay. Uh, did you want to be heard on Article 4G, Ken? No, I, I'm just moving right along. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Ken. I'm in favor of it. Let's put it that way. Okay. We're going to now move to Precinct 3, Dale Weber. Uh, Dale Weber, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Moderator. Uh, I'd like to speak on uh, Article 4G, uh, the purchase of the uh, NW26 SRE building for $40,000 at the Plymouth uh, Municipal Airport. Uh, the reason I'm speaking is to urge a, uh, a no vote for this item at this time. Uh, the town of Plymouth uh, has over $10 million uh, in its free cash uh, reserves, including at least $40,000 that's been item itemized as available for this purchase at the Plymouth Municipal Airport. <clears throat> and I wanna speak just for a minute uh, and please uh, allow me to identify myself as also 
not only a taxpayer and a ratepayer of Plymouth, but an employee representative of people that related to this article work uh, at the municipal airport. And we currently have people that are laid off, uh, Mr. Moderator and town meeting members. And those people that are laid off uh, are finding it difficult to uh, continue on. They don't have their health insurance anymore and they don't have a paycheck anymore. And some of these employees uh, come from the airport. So I would think that uh, at this time where our staff level has been depleted and prior to COVID-19, we were at levels of boots on the ground and frontline service providers in public service at a level that we were still at uh, 30 and 40 years ago. So I think it would be more beneficial for the town to not appropriate $40,000 in free cash from the airport reserves to purchase more new infrastructure and instead to figure out a way to get people back to work <clears throat> and to ease their burden that they're under. We all know the issues that the town of Plymouth has in maintaining infrastructure at this time. Uh, so that's why I'm urging a no vote on the purchase of any new uh, infrastructure that would eventually seconds. need uh, maintenance. So I'm asking you to uh, vote no <clears throat> on Article uh, 4G. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Precinct uh, 3, uh, Dale Weber. Um, we have um, other town meeting members who have previously spoken who asked to be heard. We're going to begin with uh, Precinct 12, Betsy Hall, and we're going to follow with Precinct 8, Catherine Holmes. Uh, we are debating Article 4G. And uh, this is Plymouth Town Meeting coming to you live on Saturday, October 17. Uh, Betsy Hall, uh, welcome back. Thank you, Steve. I just have a quick question. Um, well, actually, not so quick. I would like someone from the town side to please respond to the comments by uh, Town Rep Meeting Representative Dale Weber, please. That, that is my, my question, too, Steve, so you can... Okay. Uh, Catherine Holmes uh, also speaking asking for a response uh, to Dale Weber uh, from Betsy Hall and uh, also Catherine Holmes. So uh, we'll go to Melissa Arrighi, town manager, uh, responding to Betsy Hall and Catherine Holmes, uh, asking for a, an official response to Mr. Weber. Morning. Morning. So layoffs are always really difficult, and I understand these employees want to come back to work, but I think I think almost every town meeting member here knows how careful the airport manager and the airport commission is with their budget. And in order to hire employees back, that's a recurring ex expense. It comes with benefits, salary, holiday, all the benefits that come with hiring a position. Whereas these one-time expenditures that um, the airport manager and the commission are recommending are not. You would not use free cash to pay for recurring expenses, and everyone here has heard that over and over. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we're now going to go to Precinct 3. Uh, strike that. Precinct 12, Lawrence Delafield. Uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Delafield, uh, to uh, the debate on Article 4G. Uh, this is Pompey Delafield, Lawrence Delafield in Precinct 12. Uh, this is Plymouth Town Meeting. It's coming to you live on Saturday, October 17. Mr. Delafield, can you uh, hear us? We're bringing in Lawrence. Okay, uh, okay, now can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, start speaking. Yeah. Uh, the um, the uh, issue that I have is, is um, merely, uh, do we derive any benefit financially from taking on this building to offset any costs of maintenance, et cetera, that the building will have in the future? Thank you. That's uh, Lawrence Delafield um, speaking in connection with Article 4G. Um, and at this time, uh, we'll ask uh, 
Melissa Origi uh, to respond. I don't know the answer to that revenue question that was just asked by the town meeting member, but we're trying to let Tom Marr, the airport manager, uh, in as a panelist right now. Okay, and while we're waiting for him as a panelist, we're going to go to uh, Precinct 4. Uh, Charles Votrain moves to close debate. Uh, it is not uh, debatable. We're going to show the uh, speaker's queue. We're going to remove the three people that all move to close debate since they're not looking to speak. So let's remove Mr. Votrain, Mr. Williams, uh, Mr. O'Brien, and that leaves uh, speakers Everett Malagudi, Richard Barbieri, David Peck. We'll now vote on whether to close debate on Article 4G. Uh, this requires a two-thirds vote. Uh, and town meeting members will be voting on whether to close debate. Uh, and while we do that, uh, Mr. Brewster has a point of order. I'm going to go to Mr. Brewster uh, for a moment on the point of order. Uh, Mr. Brewster, uh, Precinct 5, what is your point of order? Can we bring in Wrestling Brewster, uh, Precinct 5? Uh, Mr. Brewster has a point of order, which I'll take uh, before we vote. Uh, this is Plymouth Town Meeting. You'll see on the screen here, we're live October 17, 2020. Uh, Wrestling Brewster, uh, you have not yet come in. Uh, we do have a motion to close debate. Uh, I've determined uh, that that takes precedent over any other speakers. Uh, so, Hold on. Hold on uh, Mr. Brewster, go ahead. Wrestling Brewster, speak. Yes, sorry. Um, yeah, I, we were waiting to hear from uh, the director of the airport, and, and I... Mr. Brewster, Mr. That. Brewster, the motion to close debate takes precedent. If you want to hear from somebody else, then you can vote no to close debate. Any no, other questions? we already... We were supposed to hear from this person. We were waiting for him to come in before the motion came to close debate. He has not been brought in as a panelist. Is that right? He has not signed in as a panelist. I'm sorry. Uh, and okay, I believe well. uh, at this point, your choice and the choice of all town meeting members is whether or not to close debate and vote on Article 4G or whether to continue debate. And I'm not going to have you speak further uh, because that would be speaking on the motion. Uh, unless there are any other points of order, I'm going to take the vote on whether to close debate. It requires a two-thirds vote. Town meeting members can vote. Uh, yes would be to close debate. No would be to continue debate. Uh, we're going to give 30 seconds. Voting can begin now. Uh, town meeting members have um, time in which to vote. And uh, we will uh, continue with uh, the voting on whether or not to close debate on Article 4G. Uh, town meeting members have been uh, continuing with their uh, discussion of the warrant, and we are up to Article 4G in the warrant, and the voting on this procedural motion will conclude now. We'll now determine what the vote is. 55 in favor, 61 say no, two abstentions. We will continue uh, debating uh, this article, and uh, at the same time, uh, we're going to ask PAC TV to send credentials. Oh, apparently these credentials were sent uh, to Thomas Marr, but he is not signed in, and therefore going to continue with the uh, list of requested speakers. Uh, and I'm going to go to Precinct Five, Michael Withington. He's one of four requested speakers and the only one who has not yet spoken this morning, so he will have priority over the other speakers. Uh, so we're going to go to Precinct 5, Michael Withington. Uh, Mr. Withington, good morning. Uh, we are debating Article 4G. Good go ahead. Morning, Steve. Uh, you'll have to uh, unmute yourself. Mr. Withington, we can't hear you. Uh, if you could unmute yourself and uh, we can see you. How's that? That's great. Go ahead. Good. Uh, my uh, motion uh, on the point of order had been covered by uh, Wrestling Brewster and also by the vote. So okay. I would 
on the motion to speak. Thank you very much, Thank town you. meeting members. Great We're going to continue it. with uh, Precinct 4, David Peck, um, and he'll be followed by Precinct 1, Everett Malaguti. David Peck, good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, quick question, but I don't know there, if Tom's not available, who would answer it? Where is the snow removal equip existing snow removal equipment stored now? Is it stored outside uh, or is it in a different building? So, Simple question. Uh, again, um, I understand that Thomas Marr is now in, and therefore, if he's in, we're going to go to him. Uh, Thomas Marr is the airport manager. According to the co-host, uh, Nicole Manfredi, she indicates that he is in. And if he is in as a panelist, uh, let's go to him. Uh, he did just come in, so we're going to go to him. And uh, good morning, uh, Thomas Marr. Uh, you are the airport manager. If you could respond to the question uh, from David Peck, did you hear it? Thomas Marr. Uh, I certainly did. Go ahead. Yes, can you hear me? We can hear you. Go ahead. Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, currently, the snow removal equipment is swapped out between various buildings and outside, depending on the time of year. So during the winter months, we remove the um, grass cutting uh, equipment from our current building, store that outside, and then swap in the uh, snow removal equipment. We do have an old um, building over on the northeast side of the airport that we uh, has no doors and has a, a rather large hole in the roof that we also store some of the equipment in, but it's not exactly inside storage. This, the addition of this building directly adjacent to our existing um, building would allow us to store all of our equipment inside of a dry and heated building. David thank you. Peck, further questions? No, thank you. No. Okay, we're going to go to Precinct 1, Everett Malaguti, followed by Precinct 3, William Cohen. Mr. Malaguti, good morning again. Good morning. Sorry, my video keeps going in and out, so I'm off uh, video at the moment. Um, so my question is somewhat similar to uh, Mr. Peck's, and that is um, with the uh, current building that it's in that was mentioned that has no doors and a hole in the roof. Was this an original building purchased by the uh, airport and why was it allowed to get in that sort of condition and would we see the same similar condition to this new building if it was purchased? Thomas Mars, the airport manager, responding to Everett Malaguti. Uh, certainly, that's a very good question. Um, that building was purchased back in the 1990s in pretty much the current condition. It had no doors from the uh, get-go. And the original plan was to remove the building from the airport because it, at the time it was considered an obstruction. It's not so much of an obstruction, and it served a purpose of, uh, of at least having a roof over some of the airport's equipment over the years. So it did serve a purpose, but it's not original to the airport. It was a building that was physically moved to the airport sometime in the 1950s from a, a different airport up in Hanover, Massachusetts. So it's sort of a hodgepodge collection, um, a building that had been extended and modified. And it was on private property originally. And when the airport purchased that parcel of land, what happened is uh, what came with the land was this uh, old building also. But the intent had always been to find either some other use for the building and or to remove it and replace it with something more modern. Um, in turn, I think just like our, as far as the maintenance of various buildings, um, that building was never something that had heat or electricity in its history that we're aware of, at least not since the airport had owned it. Uh, in turn, I think this uh, this new building, of course, being directly adjacent to the main center of the airport, would have uh, ample opportunity to make sure that it doesn't fall into disrepair. Malaguti, does that complete your questions? Yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go to 
Uh, Mr. Cohen has withdrawn or canceled his request to speak. We're going to go to uh, Richard Barberi, Precinct 3, followed by Dale Weber, Precinct 3. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Moderator. I have two questions. One is, what is the age of this building, and what is its life expectancy? Thank you. Mr. Marr? Uh, we have a question from Richard Barberi. We're bringing back in uh, Thomas Marr. Uh, he is the airport uh, manager and responding to... He's not here anymore. Uh, we understand he's no longer a panelist. Wait, wait, wait. He just came back oh, he just came back in. Okay. He lost his connection. He lost his connection. Uh, Mr. Marr, go ahead. Did you hear yeah. the question? I did not. Sorry. Okay, I Mr. Barberi, could you lost. repeat your question? Yes. Um, what is the age of this building, and what is its projected life? Um, the building that we wish to acquire was built in 1972, and we would anticipate that we would get a lifespan of greater than 20 years. Uh, it's a metal uh, building, and in turn, it's actually in rather decent condition, has modern doors that were installed approximately 20 years ago. So um, we think that we could get a good good utility out of it and just use common sense maintenance going into the future. So the building is 48 years old and you expect another 20 years out of it? Okay, thank At you. least. Mr. Barberi, any other questions? Uh, no, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to uh, Dale Weber, uh, followed by Michael Hanlon. Uh, Mr. Weber. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator. Uh, just to add to this, I mean, we're, we're debating right now over the efficiency of storage for uh, winter snow fighting equipment that currently has had storage for the past 25 or 30 years over employees being brought back uh, to work. Uh, so to me, this, this is a human interest story, not a equipment issue story. And the issue that the town manager spoke to regarding no recurring costs, uh, I, I certainly think that based on Mr. Barberi's previous question that the maintenance of Building infrastructure is certainly a reoccurring cost in the town of Plymouth. We know our, our history on that issue, and I just don't think this is the time to add to that burden that we currently have as to maintenance of town facilities. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, before I go to Mr. Hanlon, I have four motions to close debate from four town meeting members. Uh, I also have a point of order. I'm going to go to the point of order from Don Williams and then we'll go to the motion to close debate from Thomas Pinto. Uh, Mr. Williams, what is your point of order? Yeah, I was just wondering if we couldn't ask Mr. Marr the question no, before No, no, that's the, not a point of order. No, that's debate. You can- I was told you by, on the speaker, by, by uh, Mr. Chat Williams, to, Mr. Mr. Williams, right. you're- I quit. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna go, we're gonna go to the motion to close debate. We're gonna show the queue. We're gonna remove everybody from the queue except Mr. Delafield. Uh, everybody else in the queue is moving to close debate, so they're not requesting to speak. Uh, so let's remove Mr. Neville. And now you'll see in the queue we have one person, Lawrence Delafield. We're now going to vote on whether to close debate or whether to continue debate. Uh, and it is a two-thirds vote. And let's now um, see on the screen. There's your motion to close debate. And 30 seconds, begin voting now. Uh, town meeting members are determining whether to close debate on Article 4G or whether to continue debate on Article 4G. Uh, this is a two-thirds procedural vote. The main motion is a majority vote. Uh, town meeting has been continuing uh, chronologically with the warrant, uh, and this is coming to you live on Saturday, October 17. We are virtual uh, in Plymouth, throughout the town of Plymouth, uh, town meeting members have completed the voting on the procedural motion 
and the vote is 94 say yes, 25 no, zero abstentions. We're not going to scroll through since this was a procedural vote and it was not close. We're going to go to the main motion now on 4G. Town meeting members are going to have a chance now to vote on the main motion on 4G, um, which is uh, a majority vote. And we're going to show on the screen, here it is. We're going to give 30 seconds to vote. You're now voting now on whether or not to uh, approve Mr. Canty's motion to appropriate the sum of $40,000 uh, to pay for certain costs associated with purchasing building NW26. Uh, town meeting members are voting. Uh, and following the vote, we will continue uh, in the warrant. Uh, we are in our second uh, two-hour session of Plymouth's Fall Annual Town Meeting, and we will continue until we either adjourn or dissolve. Uh, that completes the voting on 4G. We'll have the totals. It's a majority vote. 81 say yes, 34 say no, two abstentions. The motion carries. You'll see precincts 1, 2, and 3. Town meeting members can check their votes. Uh, we're scrolling through 4, 5, and 6. Uh, we see a yellow is an abstention. Uh, the green is yes. The red is no. 7, 8, and 9. As we go through the precincts, town meeting members are checking their uh, vote to make sure that it was recorded uh, in the manner in which they intended. Precincts 10, 11, and 12. Um, and finally, we'll be looking at the final precincts 13, 14, and 15, and that completes Article 4G. We'll clear the speaker screen um, on that because we're moving on to Article 5. Article 5, Mr. Canty moves the town authorize the select board to acquire by purchase for water supply purposes and to accept the deed to the town of Plymouth of land located off Plymouth Street composed of 18 acres more or less and shown as a portion of lot 9U on map 107 located off of Plymouth Street. And this is an appropriation for 800000 to undertake the acquisition. We have the information uh, contained uh, in your packet of materials. Um, we're going to start with the main motion. Then we also have a motion to amend. And on the main motion, we're going to go to Kevin Canty. He is the chair of the Advisory and Finance Committee. Mr. Canty, on Article 5, your motion. Thank you. In a unanimous vote of 12 to 0 with no abstentions, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 5. This article will facilitate the acquisition of the Franklin Marsh Bog, the final piece necessary to owning all the water rights to Darby Pond, which will allow the town to submit a permit modification to DEP requesting that the pumping restriction there be lifted. Lifting this pumping restriction will allow the well that is already there to operate at full permitted capacity, which will significantly help to meet the growing water needs of the town. This article is of particular importance. The town is already having problems meeting water demand at peak usage times. And as we all know, the town continues to grow, which will only add to the water demands in the future. Often, when an expensive project or acquisition comes before town meeting, the question is asked, isn't there a cheaper or more cost-effective alternative? To be clear, in this instance, this article is the cheaper alternative. If the town were to seek alternative means to obtain the same increase to the water supply, it would require the construction of a new well and other additional water infrastructure expenses and involve years of additional work to locate a suitable site for such an endeavor. It is estimated that such an alternative would cost the town and the taxpayers upwards of $2 million. While many, including the Advisory and Finance Committee, are not delighted by the price tag of this item, this article's price tag is still $1.2 million below the cost of constructing a new well at an as of yet unknown location to achieve the same result. The current owners of this parcel use it to make money. Currently, they use it to make money by producing cranberries. They recognize the value of the parcel to the town's water needs and are willing to part with the parcel 
for this $800,000 sale price in the purchase and sale agreement that has been negotiated, which will also make them some money. If the town is unable to come up with this money, the current owners will retain ownership of the parcel and continue to use it to produce cranberries, which will continue to negatively impact the town's water supply and force the town to look elsewhere and spend significantly more money to solve its current and future water supply problems. That is why this article is, in fact, already the cheaper and more cost-effective solution to this issue. And that is why the Advisory and Finance Committee unanimously recommends town meeting approve Article 5. Anti is the chair of the Advisory and Finance Committee. We're going to bring in Precinct 8 Jerry Williams, and as we bring her in, uh, we're going to record that Nate Siegel voted yes on uh, the last Article 4G, and Margaret Cohane, uh, Precinct 3, voted yes on 4E. 4E. Uh, and now uh, Jerry Williams, Precinct 8, moves to reduce the appropriation by 125000 thereby limiting the authorization for the purchase to 675000 uh, Mrs. Williams, on your motion to amend. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for hearing me um, and my motion. Jerry Williams, Precinct 8. I um, proposed this motion because I uh, felt that the $800,000 was cons uh, more than twice the appraised value of the property and that we, um, as custodians of the taxpayer funds and a responsible town meeting member that I needed to, to point out that this was a very significant increase over the um, amount. Also, because of the lease hole on the property, the water would not necessarily be available for three years. Um, and so it might not, I, I understand that building a new well would take even longer, but I was concerned what, by the lease hold on the property. And those are my reasons for, um, I felt that if town meeting um, reduced the funding permitted for this, authorized for this um, purchase, that perhaps um, the owners would come back to the table and consider a lesser amount. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and that's Jerry Williams on her motion to amend from Precinct 8. Uh, we're going to begin now uh, with our speakers, and we're going to begin with Precinct 15, Richard Neely, followed by Precinct 10, Brendan Brady. Mr. Neely, good morning. We're debating uh, Article 5. We have a main motion, and we also have a motion to amend. And um, we're bringing in Richard Neely from Precinct 15. And it's just audio, Mr. Neely. Good morning. Go ahead and speak. Good morning, Mr. Moderator. I wish to commend, first of all, the Public Works Department and the engineer itself who have sent out a wonderful, complete explanation of why they are recommending this purchase as an argument against the amendment. I realize that the amount asking is greater than the uh, evaluated amount value of the land, but the value of the water and its availability is priceless. Therefore, I argue we should be voting against this amendment, which may put us in jeopardy of having to pay even more than we have in this agreed agreement. That's it. Thank you. Ten, Brendan Brady, followed by Precinct 11, Chris Merrill. Uh, we're debating Article 5, a main motion, as well as a motion to amend. When we close debate, we'll first be voting on the motion to amend. Mr. Brady, good morning. Uh, good morning, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. I'm actually just curious uh, if someone from the town can answer this question. I don't argue against the property owner's desire to make money off of it. That makes sense. But did they explain, <clears throat> excuse me, how they came up with this valuation? So the appraisal was 390. Why wasn't it just double at 780? So if someone from the town could speak to that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. 
so with respect to this, uh, I'm first going to go to Lynn Barrett, uh, which may not be direct on this if she can't answer that question. Uh, I did want her to talk about the funding. So we'll start with Lynn Barrett, the Director of Finance, and then if necessary we can go to a, uh, another town official to further respond uh, to Mr. Brady. Uh, Lynn Barrett is the Director of Finance, uh, and we are debating Article 5. Go ahead, Lynn. Hi. Um, where I wasn't part of negotiations, I would probably defer this question to David Gould because I believe he referred to it at, a, at the COPC meeting. So I would ask David to answer that question. And Lynn Barrett, while you have the floor, uh, can you, uh, since we have you, uh, if the motion to amend passes, uh, where would the reduction come from? We would, um, we would hope that the motion doesn't pass, but if it does, the reduction would come from the uh, 40R Smart Growth Funding. Thank you. Um, we're now going to go to David Gould to further respond to Brendan Brady. Mr. Gould. Thank you. So the appraisal that was done in this property is a very traditional real estate appraisal. It takes into account what the Westons could do with the property uh, from an earth, a sand and gravel earth removal, or uh, single family house lots, that type of thing. It doesn't look specifically at the value of water. Um, there are very few uh, appraisers that can value land from a public water supply. And when they can, it's extremely expensive. I've done a couple of these projects in the past, um, including one eminent domain taking for a public water supply. We did reach out um, to over eight different appraisers, none of whom uh, would even touch it. We did reach one firm uh, that was willing to do it at a minimum of $50,000 to do the evaluation. Uh, they're typically that expensive because they're going to be concerned that there will be um, uh, a legal challenge to their appraisal when it comes to public water supply. So again, the appraisal that everyone's looking at is a traditional appraisal. Um, it does have some value, uh, but for, a, for, for this project, it probably has very little, if any, real value um, in terms of what the, um, the value of the property is to the town of Plymouth which is strictly for public water supply. Now, when we sat down and negotiated with the Wessons about the property, um, I can tell you that I was fairly confident that the request uh, that the Wessons would provide um, would probably be over a million dollars. Um, at 800,000, I, I was fairly surprised by that. I, I did think it would be a challenge to um, convince town meeting to pay more than double the appraised value of the property. Um, but I fully expected the, the request from the Westons to be over a million. And I do think, uh, based on my experience, that if we did have an appraisal that was done solely for water purposes, the value would have been well in excess of a million dollars. So it is more than the appraised value, but I think it's well worth it. Um, and I can tell you that if the Westons had come to us and said we want $1.2 million for the land, I would still be here at town meeting recommending that the town um, make the acquisition at that price. So I do think 800000 is a completely reasonable number. Thank you. David Gould is Director of Marine and Environmental Affairs. We're going to move now to Precinct 11, Christopher Merrill, followed by Precinct 5, Patricia McCarthy. Uh, Mr. Merrill, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. My question is, have we done an environmental impact study on this property? And if so, because it's uh, prior use is, is being used as a cranberry bog, my concern is the environmental impact on the water. Thank you. Thank you. David Gould, responding, Director of Marine and Environmental Affairs, uh, with an inquiry regarding an impact study. So we have not done an impact study. We certainly do know that it was an active cranberry bog. Uh, the town owns several um, former cranberry bogs. So we do know there was obviously fertilizer, herbicides, pesticides applied. Um, as long as those activities are done in accordance with the regulations, um, then that's an allowable activity. What I would say in regards to both the Grenier bogs and the Western bogs um, that we're talking about today is that um, both of which were located in the zone two of the well, and now you have these bogs that are no longer going to be farmed. So there is no future application of fertilizers, herbicides, or pesticides on these properties. In fact, um, the new proposed bogs that the Westons will construct uh, are going to be located outside of the zone two of the well. So when it comes to an environmental standpoint and the application of those chemicals, um, I think it's a significant benefit not only to the pond, 
uh, but also to the well and the water quality associated with the public water supply. Uh, thank you, David Gould. Mr. Merrill, any other questions? No, okay, we're gonna go precinct five, uh, Patricia McCarthy, and we're gonna follow with um, Michael Hanlon. Patricia McCarthy, precinct five. Um, thank you. Um, I am speaking in favor of the main motion, and I wanna first of all thank um, the town, the committee of precinct chairs, and all who were involved in getting all the data um, to us on the previous water studies, on the master plan, on the needs for conservation and the formation of the Water Conservation Committee, all pointing to how important water is to all of us and our need to protect our water supply and protect our environment. And this um, deal has been negotiated already so if this amendment were to pass, there is no deal. So we cannot go back. We cannot then reauthorize the $800,000 until next year. And then we lose time and we could lose the whole deal. And a well will go up in price. It's around $2 million now for a new well, and we don't even know where it could go. So I ask you to vote yes on the main motion and no on the amendment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, before we go to Mr. Hanlon, I have a motion to close debate, Precinct 11, Francis James O'Brien. This would be a motion to close debate on the motion to amend. Uh, it is not debatable. You'll see here is the speaker's queue. We'll take Mr. O'Brien off of the queue, uh, but you can note that Mr. Hanlon did want to speak. Uh, this is the motion to close debate on the motion to amend. Uh, we will now take the vote on the motion to close debate on uh, Ms. Geraldine Williams' uh, motion to amend. We're going to show that uh, motion to close debate. We're going to show that on the screen. Here it is. We're going to give 30 seconds. You can vote now. Town meeting members are voting on whether to close debate on the motion to amend. Uh, it is a two-thirds vote. It is a procedural vote, and we will take a vote on whether... Uh, to amend uh, Article 5's main motion from the Advisory and Finance Committee. Uh, the motion to amend uh, from uh, Geraldine Williams, uh, Precinct 8, was to reduce the appropriation by 125000 Town meeting members are deciding whether to close debate on that motion to amend. Uh, we will now look to see the results of from town meeting. 93 say yes, 23 say no, one abstention. We're closing debate on the motion to amend. We're now going to go and vote on the motion to amend. And we're going to take a vote. This is on the motion to amend to um, reduce by 125,000. We're going to, when we see that up on the screen, town meeting members uh, will be voting on a motion to amend. The motion to amend is a majority vote. Uh, the main motion, it'll be two thirds, but this procedural, uh, well, this motion to amend uh, it's substantive, but it's going to be a majority vote. You can vote now. You have 30 seconds in which to vote as to whether or not to amend Article 5 uh, as presented by the Advisory and Finance Committee. We have the motion to amend. Once we complete uh, this vote, we will continue to have debate on the main motion unless I receive any more procedural motions. Uh, I don't have any procedural motions at this time. Uh, so we'll first complete the voting on this motion to amend, and the voting ends now. We will see what the results of the vote would be. 26 say yes, 93 say no, zero abstentions. The motion does not carry. We're now going to scroll through the precincts since this is a substantive vote, and we're in precincts 4, 5, and 6. And following uh, this, we will continue uh, to debate uh, the main motion on Article 5, uh, absent any other procedural motions, we're in the precincts 10, 11, and 12. Uh, town meeting is continuing to uh, debate in precincts 13, 14, and 15. And we've completed uh, the, the scrolling on the motion to amend, and we're now going to go back to the main motion. Uh, and I see that a number of the speakers uh, have previously spoken, so... I'm going to try to determine who 
did not speak as often or on this article already. I'm going to go uh, to Kenneth Howe, Precinct 11. Uh, Kenneth Howe, uh, Precinct 11, uh, to be followed uh, by Edward Conroy. Mr. Howe, uh, I believe last time we heard you, we didn't see you. Uh, Mr. Howe, do we have your audio? Uh, Kenneth Howe is with Precinct 11. Uh, Mr. Ka Howe, did you care to speak? Is what? Your microphone is not on, I'm told, Mr. Howe. Uh, Kenneth Howe, Precinct 11. Um, and we may have to come back to him if his microphone... He's got no audio. He's got no audio. Okay, we're going to go to Precinct 5, Edward Conroy. Mr. Conroy, welcome. Thank Ed you. Go ahead. What I speak about is supporting this article. Um, as the town may know that there's two pressure zones in the town, one in the northern pressure zone, the other one is the southern pressure zone. This purchase would affect the northern pressure zone. So the prior uh, Article 4E related to the southern pressure zone, they're not interconnected. Um, the northern pressure zone uh, is currently operating at a deficit. So what that means is if one of the major water sources goes offline, and for the northern pressure zones, either South Pond Well Number 2, the Bradford Treatment Plant, or the North Plymouth Well goes offline, there'll be a water, water supply will be restricted. Currently, there's a number of projects that will affect the northern pressure zone. Um, one is 800 Colony Place, Newfield Estates, Tanya's Stump Pre-K School, 150 Water Street, that's the large hotel on Water Street. Um, other things such as the 40B at Home Depot Drive, uh, that was only approved on the residential side and the commercial side was not submitted because there was no water for the commercial side. We have the walk in Plymouth, which is uh, another 40B that's proposed that would have 320 units, a proposed 506 bedrooms. So we have an awful lot of projects coming up that are gonna continue to worsen to have this uh, northern pressure zone operated as a, as a deficit. So my concern is say we don't purchase this property for 800,000, um, we will, and then all these projects come online, what does the water supply will be restricted? What does that mean to us? Uh, my understanding is that possibly North Plymouth will not have water. So um, we have a lot of things, we have a lot of projects coming up, 40 Bs, we have no say in. We, we have, uh, the walk is gonna be 320 units. We already have the one at Home Depot, which has been approved, but not permitted. So um, I'd like us to make, a, in, my, in my opinion, this is a wise purchase and we somewhat have no choice. So I'm in full support of voting in favor of Article 5. Thank you. Thank you. Precinct 15, Michael Hanlon uh, will be followed by uh, precinct 4, Gene Patnode Lane. Uh, Mr. Hanlon, good morning. Uh, this is Plymouth Town Meeting. It's coming to you live on October 17. And pre Precinct 15, Michael Hanlon. Uh, it says he'll be rejoining the webinar as a panelist. So he's being brought in from being an attendee to being a panelist. Um, town meeting members, there. Right. good morning. Go good ahead. Good morning. Thank you, moderator. Um, I apologize. I've been having trouble with V Voter because I can't see the speaker button. Uh, I want to speak in favor of this article. There's no question in my mind that we need this water. We'll need it today, and we certainly need it for the future. Uh, my, uh, you know, this is also, and I think I, we need to remind town meeting members, this is being paid through the Water Enterprise Fund. It's not going on the general fund and not funded by the taxpayers in general. So I think we, uh, we all should support this article. Thank you. Thank you. And before we go to any more speakers, Precinct 14, Christopher Hull. Moves to close debate. We'll show the queue. We'll remove him from the queue uh, since he's not looking to speak. 
Uh, there's the queue. Uh, we still have Mr. Peck, Mr. Howe, Mr. Weber, Mr. Butterfield, Ms. Patno Lane, Mr. Hamm, and Mr. Withington. So a motion to close debate on the main motion, Article 5. It is not debatable. We will now go to the vote. Uh, we will show it on the screen. Uh, we will give town meeting members 30 seconds in which to vote. And it is not debatable. Um, we have been debating Article 5. Uh, and town meeting members can see they can vote now, 30 seconds. This is whether to close debate on Article 5 and whether or not you wish to move uh, to a vote uh, on the Article 5 that has been presented by the Advisory and Finance Committee. Uh, a motion to close debate is a two-thirds vote, and town meeting members are voting on whether to close debate, and uh, they have seven seconds in which to vote. Uh, Plymouth Town Meeting is coming to you live on Saturday, October 17. Uh, we have finished the voting, and now here's the vote. 82 say yes, and no, 37, zero abstentions. The motion carries by more than two-thirds. We will now clear the speaker list, and we will go to vote on the main motion, Article 5. Article 5 is the motion from the Advisory and Finance Committee. It will require a two-thirds vote. We're looking for the vote on the screen. Town meeting members will use their V voter platform. They will vote on Article 5. Uh, town meeting is coming to you live on Saturday, October 17. There's the vote. 30 seconds, begin voting. Town meeting members are voting on the main motion as originally proposed. Uh, upon the completion of this vote, we will move to Article 6. Uh, town meeting members have 30 seconds to vote on each uh, motion. They have been uh, participating since 8 a.m. this morning. We began with opening ceremonies. Uh, we have been going through the warrant. Uh, they've had a number of procedural votes as well as many substantive votes uh, this morning uh, at our fall annual town meeting. This completes the vote on Article 5. We now look 111 say yes, no, 8, 1 abstention. The motion carries by more than two-thirds. We now move to Article 6. Mr. Canty moves the town uh, appropriate, and we're scrolling through the precincts on that last vote in case there were any votes that did not get tabulated. But I'll read into the record Article 6, which is that the town appropriate the sum of $17,500 to pay costs associated with the cyanobacteria sampling of various ponds, including all costs incidental or related thereto, and that to meet this appropriation, 17500 be transferred from the Environmental Affairs Fund. This is the majority vote, and we will hear from uh, Kevin Canty, uh, Chair of the Advisory and Finance Committee. We've gone through the precincts. Let's bring in Kevin Canty on his motion uh, on behalf of the Advisory and Finance Committee. This is on Article 6, and uh, town meeting continues. Uh, in its second uh, two-hour segment uh, of town meeting. And uh, we are continuing in the warrant. We are on Article 6. Kevin Canty is the chair of the areas. Mr. Canty, welcome back. Thank you. In a unanimous vote of 12 to 0 with no abstentions, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 6. This article will provide funding for the Department of Marine and Environmental Affairs and the health department to sample public and private water bodies for toxins that are potential health risks. This project would be funded from the Environmental Affairs Fund. Thank you. Uh, and we're now going to move to Precinct 8, Donald Williams, who has asked to be uh, heard. Uh, Mr. Williams, welcome. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, town meeting reps. I just want to support this because we, we had direct experience with the uh, cyanobacteria blooms, and it was questionable how we were going to know how bad off we were. The tests are $150 each, and you have to have two successful tests in the two weeks in a row, which makes $450. Now, a lot of the ponds in this town don't have watershed associations, and it's difficult for them to get these tests done. So in the interest of getting ponds back to uh, being reopened, I think it's important that we have this, this uh, money available uh, and 
able to be used by these ta by these watershed associations that don't uh, that, that that have problems, and specifically by the people who don't have watershed associations. So I urge you to vote yes on this. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Tom. Uh, John Williams. Williams. We're going to go to Precinct Seven. Nathan Siegel, uh, Mr. Siegel, good morning. Good morning, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I'm gonna support this article and I thank uh, Mr. Williams for speaking on this and the previous pond um, testing article, but I wanted to ask maybe Mr. Gould or someone from the town, uh, is there a coordination of efforts with these testing um, that's being done on the various ponds for cyanobacteria and other issues there was um, a year or two ago, there was the, um, the issue with the Bartlett Pond uh, watershed system. So, you know, I support uh, figuring out what's causing these issues and solving them for sake of uh, property values and, and public safety. But I also want to make sure that there's some coordination and that it's not being done piecemeal and any efficiencies are being found um, where possible. Thank you. Thank you. David Gould is the Director of Marine Environmental Affairs responding to Nate Siegel. Mr. Gould. So the cyanobacteria blooms are, are especially interesting in that it does uh, cross um, multiple departments. So we work closely with public health because um, obviously it's an environmental issue, but it's also a public health issue. We don't want people um, or pets um, getting sick from um, not knowing that they shouldn't be going into these water bodies. So we do work closely with them. We also have a very good working relationship with uh, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, um, which is able to provide a lot of information when questions arise about the types of balloons we're seeing. Um, so public health, the Department of Public Health for the Commonwealth and Marine Environmental Players have, have been working pretty closely on all of these projects. As far as um, going forward with things like the Bartlett um, Watershed Study, that's gonna involve even other, other departments to, to actually implement some of those things. So yes, there is quite a bit of coordination uh, that happens now and it's probably gonna be even more um, necessary in the future. Thank you. Siegel, anything further? Um, yes, I mean, thank you for that. From a financial perspective, are there efficiencies to be had? Mr. Gould? So the responsibility of the local, um, the local municipality to do the sampling. And so this article is so that if, um, if we have an issue or um, public health has an issue, obviously we're coordinating, um, but government can use that. So public health needs to do additional sampling from a public health perspective that wouldn't necessarily be an environmental issue uh, for DMEA, um, they're gonna be able to utilize that fund. I do think based on the number of ponds that we've had, which has been over a dozen this past year, that the 17,500 should get us two, even three years worth of necessary sampling. So it's something that uh, should help us going forward for quite some time. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, we're gonna now move to uh, Precinct 12, Lawrence Delafield. Uh, to be followed by Precinct 4, Gene Patton Lane. Mr. Delafield, morning again. Yes, good morning. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay, just quickly, uh, representing an area of six ponds, which is right near um, Herring Pond, and with having some of the same problems here in our area, I think it is very important that we support this and hopefully that it will help all areas uh, within the town. So I just want to give my support to this. Thank you. Uh, Jean Patno Lane, Precinct 4, uh, to be followed by, uh, well, Jean Patno Lane uh, will bring you in. Uh, do we have audio, video? And uh, while we're doing that, we're going to go to Precinct uh, she'll be followed by Precinct 13, Daniel Gorsica. Uh, so Precinct 4, Jean Patnode Lane. And we welcome her to uh, Plymouth Town Meeting. And do we see her? Uh, bring her in. There she is. Good morning, Jean. Coming in. We have 365 ponds in Plymouth, and I live on one of them. Uh, most of the, not most of the year, only in the summertime and the, the spring and fall, as long as I can live on the pond. But I understand that we had a scare on Boot Pond about this, very slight scare down where more of the houses are. And, and I even heard that the dogs shouldn't be in the water 
and we really need testing. We've done a little bit of testing and it turned out to be safe after a while. We, uh, this is, I support this article wholeheartedly so I can swim in the pond as long as possible. And also, you know, I don't have to worry about the labrador retriever that lives near there running in the water. So I really think we have to have clean water. That's why the pilgrims came here anyway, because they ran out of drinking supplies on the boat. And we, this is the treasure that we have underground in Plymouth, the very treasure of the water. And it should be kept pristine and clean as possible, even though we grow cranberries here and that sometimes problems. But this water supply and this cyanobacteria is something I've never heard of before, but I think I know what it looks like, not even on the water committee for Boot and South Lawn, but we really appreciate help supporting making sure that it's clean with these tests. So I'm totally in favor of this article and it should be unanimous, I think. Thank um, you, uh, Jean Patton O'Lane, uh, town meeting member, precinct four, and apparently also a historian. Uh, we're now gonna go to a motion to close debate. We have a couple of them. Uh, we'll take the first one from David Peck. Um, so if we can show the speaker's cue, removing Mr. Peck and Mr. Cunningham, we're moving to close debate. That leaves uh, only uh, the other two speakers uh, that we had, Mr. Gorsaker uh, and the other speaker uh, that was on here uh, that we can restore. And at this time, um, we're going to take a vote on whether to close debate on Article 6. It's a not debatable. Uh, we had two people that still wanted to be heard. Uh, a motion to close debate. Uh, is to end debate. We have 30 seconds. We're going to show that. Vote now. You're voting on whether to close debate under Article 6. Uh, Plymouth Town Meeting is in its second uh, two-hour session. Uh, at the noon hour, uh, we will, uh, at, at the noon hour, we will take a brief recess uh, and continue with Plymouth Town Meeting. And uh, this is coming to you live uh, at uh, on October 17 with all the little uh, glitches that can occur in a live broadcast, but we're doing very well getting through the warrant and having uh, much debate. Uh, 102 vote yes, 11 vote no, zero abstentions. We are closing debate. It's procedural. We're not gonna go through the precincts. We're gonna go right now to the main substantive motion under Article 6. We're gonna show that uh, to town meeting members and then they will have a chance to vote as to whether or not to approve or not approve Article 6 uh, contained in the warrant. Uh, town meeting is coming to you live. There it is, Article 6, 30 seconds, start voting now. You're voting on Article 6. Uh, we now have 125 town meeting members in attendance. We are setting records for uh, participation with our virtual uh, remote participation. Uh, we have 126, that is a record. Uh, of town meeting members uh, participating in voting at one time. Uh, in the summer, we did have 125 uh, for one of them. Uh, so currently, uh, the vote has ended. We're waiting for the results. 115 in favor, no in opposition, zero abstentions. Uh, the motion does carry. We're scrolling through the precincts. And uh, as we scroll through the precincts, I will read into the record Article 7. You may recall Article 7 was originally included in the consent agenda. Uh, the consent agenda did not pass. We will now take Article 7 separately. Uh, town meeting members are checking their votes on the last article. Uh, but under Article 7, Mr. Canty moves the town appropriate the sum of 45800 to pay cost associated with purchasing and installing plantings within the Foothills Preserve Stream and Wetlands Restoration Project including all costs, incidental or related expenses thereto, and that to meet this appropriation, 45,800 be transferred from the Environmental Affairs Fund. It's a majority vote, and Mr. Canty, on your motion. In a unanimous vote of 12 to zero with no abstentions, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 7. The purpose of this article is to complete the restoration project and allow for the purchase and installation of 2,200 plantings for the stream and wetlands restoration at the Foothills Preserve. 
considerable funds have already been contributed to this project by federal and state agencies, as well as private stakeholders. This article represents the town share of the project and the funding would come from the Environmental Affairs Fund. Thank you. And uh, discussion on Article 7. There are no speaker requests on Article 7, so we'll now take a vote on Article 7. This is a vote on the main motion. Uh, we have no requests from town meeting members to discuss this article, which was con included in the consent agenda. We'll now vote. Please begin voting. Town meeting members have 30 seconds in which to vote. And uh, in the meantime, I'm going to say that Bill Cohen voted yes on the last article. Mr. Cohen, since you've had multiple times when your vote didn't go through, uh, please call the help desk at 774 773 6111. We are voting uh, on Article 7. Uh, the voting uh, now has been complete, and we will now. Uh, take the time to go through the votes, uh, and you'll see uh, the final vote. 112 said yes, two said no, one abstention. It carries, and here's the total. And just as an explanation of town meeting members, when we have an in-person uh, town meeting, it is possible for the moderator to take a voice vote on those articles where there is not a lot of discussion and to count the no's. Uh, in this case, obviously, we have to do uh, the roll call vote uh, through V Voter, which is why, uh, in order uh, to be uh, efficient with the time, uh, we have selected a few articles that we thought would be fairly uh, non controversial, be part of a consent agenda. There was no discussion uh, on this article, and we see that uh, the vote is fairly unanimous. Uh, we'll continue now with Article 8. Article 8, Mr. Canty moves the town appropriate the sum of $10,000 to pay costs associated with purchasing and equipping an educational trailer for the Department of Marine and Environmental Affairs, including all costs incidental or related expenses thereto, and that to meet this appropriation, $10,000 be transferred from the Environmental Affairs Fund to affect such purchase. It's a majority vote. Mr. Kevin Canty is the chair of the Advisory and Finance Committee. Mr. Canty. In a unanimous vote of 12 to 0 with no abstentions, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 8. Approval of this article will allow the Department of Marine and Environmental Affairs to purchase a mobile education trailer for the purpose of providing an educational learning experience in coordination with the schools. The trailer can also be used at local events where it would be available to residents and tourists. The focus of the educational materials on offer will be numerous native fish, birds and waterfowl, marine animals, assorted woodland critters, and various other forms of local wildlife that can be found in and around Plymouth. The trailer will include displays and tasteful taxidermy. This project would be funded from the Environmental Affairs Fund. Thank you. Um, for the last vote, Article 7, uh, we have a yes for Stacy De La Cruz and a yes uh, for Margaret Cohen. Um, and that's on Article 7. We're now going to go on um, Article 8. We're going to begin with uh, Michael Withington, Precinct 5. Uh, Michael Withington, Precinct 5. Uh, and we have a number of people requesting uh, to be heard. Uh, we're going to begin with Precinct 5, Michael Withington. And Mr. Withington, good morning. Good morning. We can hear you. Good morning, you. Uh, Go ahead. moderator. Members, Michael Withington from, from Precinct 5. Michael Withington from Precinct 5. Good morning, town meeting members and Mr. Moderator. Just a quick question on this project. Uh, I'm not opposed to it, uh, but is this trailer a walk into trailer or is it a walk up to trailer? In other words, will the COVID uh, uh, gathering restrictions negatively impact this, this trailer? And I know that's a, a tough question to ask, but uh, it's worth uh, asking the question anyway. So uh, David, if you could enlighten me on this, this would be great. Thank you. 
Uh, we'll first go to David Gould, and uh, we can certainly, uh, Mr. Gould. Yeah, so it is a walkthrough trailer. There's a there's a door in the front, and then the back of the trailer um, has a ramp, so it is ADA compliant. It's a walkthrough trailer. Um, certainly, there are some restrictions going forward until the, the COVID-19 situation resolves itself. Um, so we'll have to, you know, either limit the use of it or limit how we use it. Um, but at the end of the day, it is a walkthrough trailer that allows us to put the displays up um, and allow people to walk through the trailer as well as see tables on the exterior of the trailer as well. Thank you. Okay. Th thank you, David. You answered my question. Uh, I look forward to the tasteful, tasteful taxidermy display. So, uh, Next, you. we're going to go Precinct 12, Betsy Hall, followed by Precinct 8, Donald Williams. Betsy Hall, uh, on Article 8, you care to be heard? Welcome back. Yes, uh, I would like to be heard. I just have a question about the manpower for David Gould. Who will be uh, operating this? Will it be volunteers? Will it be members of the Environmental Department? Um, so I'd just like to know how this will be, what kind of personnel will this will require? Thank you. Betsy Hall questioning David Gould, Director of Departmental Marine and Environmental Affairs. Mr. Gould. So it would certainly be uh, DMEA staff, um, certainly for operating the truck trailer and getting it to the locations. Um, we would certainly welcome volunteers um, to, you know, help describe um, the specimens and some of the skeleton structures and, and some of the plants and animals that we'll have. So we would certainly welcome that, but there will always be at least um, at least one DMEA staff person uh, on site with the trailer at all times. Um, if I could, I'd also like to provide a quick update on the project from this morning. If I could do that, Mr. Moderator. We have a little bit of time. Go ahead, Mr. Gould. Um, I received a, a pretty wonderful email this morning at 1015 from uh, Kenny Semkin from Second Wind Brewing Company, um, who very much wanted to see the article pass. Um, and in order to help that, uh, to do that, he uh, generously offered $3,500 um, towards the trailer this morning. Um, so I wanted to make town members aware of that additional donation that, we, um, that was pledged this morning. Thank you. Uh, Precinct 8, Donald Williams, followed by Precinct 10, Peter Neville. Uh, Mr. Williams on Article 8. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, we've had the privilege of having so many great articles to discuss on, on water and water quality. And this one speaks to the education issue. Uh, it's got broad community support. Uh, there's already been $7,900 donated, including $500 from the Herring Ponds Watershed Association. But here we have an opportunity to educate both children and adults on some of the factors that go into uh, the area that surrounds us. Water is a big part of that, and certainly water is important for plants, animals, fish, birds, shellfish, uh, bees, and butterflies. So... Please join me in, in voting yes for this. It's an exciting opportunity. And by the way, David, uh, I volunteer to come and speak at this uh, at this trailer once it gets up and running on anything to do with water quality. Uh, we're, I'm willing to help. So thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. And thank town you, meeting. Donald Williams, Precinct 8. I have several motions to close debate. We'll start with the first one, Patricia McCarthy, Precinct 5. Let's show the queue and remove Ms. McCarthy, let's remove Jeffrey Delap uh, from the queue, and that leaves uh, the remaining two speakers. Uh, Tommy will now vote on whether to close debate on Article 8. Uh, it is uh, to uh, move on uh, to debating, uh, to voting on the main motion if it passes. If it does not pass, we'll continue debate. We'll show now on the screen the motion to close debate. There it is. We have 30 seconds. You have it. You'll start voting now. You're voting on whether to close debate. It's a procedural motion. It is a two-thirds vote. Town meeting members uh, have been uh, actively uh, debating and voting uh, throughout the morning, uh, both with procedural votes, substantive votes. Uh, they have successfully uh, joined 126 town meeting members uh, participating. We have 135 elected. Uh, there were a couple that notified the town clerk as uh, to their absence, but a high level of participation and also a very good use of the voter 
uh, both in voting and as well as speakers and motions. Uh, 106 say yes, eight say no, zero abstentions. It passes, it's procedural, and it's a two-thirds vote, by the way, not a majority. And uh, it passes, we're not gonna scroll through the precincts. Since it's procedural, we're gonna go to the main motion under Article 8. This will be a majority vote. We're gonna show on the screen that you'll be voting on Article 8 uh, for the trailer, uh, whether to vote yes or no. It's a majority vote. We'll see the uh, vote on the screen, and then TAMI members will be able to vote on Article 8. There it is. You have 30 seconds. Vote now. TAMI members are voting on Article 8. They have 30 seconds as we continue to move through uh, the warrant on the fall annual town meeting. Uh, we continue uh, on Saturday, October 17. We began at 8 a.m. We will go approximately another half hour before we take a short recess. Uh, town meeting members are continuing uh, through the warrant uh, as it has been set out uh, by the select board. Voting ends on Article 8. We're going to see the vote. 110 say yes, 7 no, 1 abstentions. It carries. We're going to scroll through the precincts so that town meeting members can see how they voted. We're going to clear the speakers list uh, for Article 8. And while we look, we're going to read into the record Article 9A. Mr. Canty moves to rescind the votes taken under Article 16B, National Meeting House Restoration Project, and Article 16C. Stevens Field Restoration and Rehabilitation Project of the August 10, 2020 Annual Town Meeting. Further to amend the action taken of the following August 10, 2020 Annual and Special Town Meeting Articles by rescinding the original funding sources, therefore authorizing the new funding sources as listed in the chart below. You have a chart. Um, we have seen all the precincts on the previous uh, article, and we're going to remove the speakers from the previous article off of the speaker's queue. And we're now going to hear from Kevin Canty. He is the chair of the Advisory and Finance Committee. In a unanimous vote of 12 to 0 with no abstentions, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 9A. This article is a housekeeping item that will correct some inaccuracies with Community Preservation Act funding sources relative to Article 16 of the annual and Article 9 of the special August 2020 town meetings based on an updated calculation of the actual available funds in the CPA fund due to the ongoing pandemic, the effects thereof, and a reduction in the state's matching funds from last year. Thank you. We're going to move to Precinct 10, Brendan Brady. We're debating Article 9A on the warrant for the fall annual town meeting. Uh, Mr. Brady, welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I was actually hoping uh, Mr. Cohen can clarify something. The reading of this article suggests we're rescinding prior authorizations and, and correcting some line items here. But my concern is that there is no line item in that table for the restoration and rehabilitation of Stevens Field. So I'm wondering, are we abandoning the monies for that restoration? Uh, and if so, why is that? Because it's something that's been in the planning and development stage for a number of years now. So we'll Thank go you. back first uh, to uh, William Cohen to ask uh, whether he wishes to answer, or if not, we'll go to another uh, panelist. Uh, I do want to report that Linda McCaldiff voted yes on Article 8, uh, for the record, Linda McCaldiff. So let's go I to... Uh, is that Lynn Barrett? I could answer this question. Uh, Lynn Barrett's Director of Finance. Uh, Lynn, did you want to come in uh, to uh, speak and respond to Mr. Brady? Go ahead. Yes. Yes. So, uh, Mr. Brady, this has nothing to do with um, the Stevens, the construction or the project itself of Stevens Field. The only thing we're doing is rescinding paying down the debt of 250,000. That's what we had done in August. And we're recommending not to do that at this time. We're going to bring that forward in April. We have not borrowed any money for Stevens Field yet because we'll start to borrow money when they start to construct the project, which is going to happen. Um, as I understand, permits have all been received and that project is going to be starting soon. Mr. Brady, does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. Thank you. 
Any further discussion on Article 9A? I don't see any speakers. If not, we're going to go to the vote on Article 9A. Town meeting members will be voting. It's a majority vote uh, for Article 9A. Uh, we're looking for the vote. There it is on the screen. You've got 30 seconds. Vote now. Town meeting members are voting on Article 9A. Um, we have a main motion from the Advisory and Finance Committee. And following 9A, we will continue uh, with Article 9 and continue with Article 9B. Uh, Plymouth Town Meeting is coming live on Saturday, October 17. Town Meeting members are at Plymouth North High School. They are remote in their homes and other locations. We are also here at PAC TV Studios. Uh, this completes the voting on Article 9A. And here's the vote. 119, yes. Zero, no, zero abstentions. It is unanimous. Uh, we're not going to go, well, we can scroll the precincts, but I'm going to read Article 9B. Uh, Mr. Canty moves the town vote to authorize the Board of Selectmen to acquire by purchase for open space and recreational purposes pursuant to the Community Preservation Program and to accept the deed to the town of Plymouth of land located off Tall Pines Road, composed of 34 acres, more or less and further appropriate 117,000 to undertake such acquisition to meet this appropriate transfer 117,000 from fiscal 2021 Community Preservation Act Fund. You have the entire text. Kevin Canty, Chair of the Advisory and Finance Committee. In a vote of 12 to zero with one abstention, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 9B. Approval of this article will appropriate $117,000 in the Community Preservation Act fund reserves for open space and recreational purposes. This acquisition off Tall Pines Road will provide protection to the headwaters of the Eel River and Russell Mills Pond. Protecting Plymouth's sole source aquifer will aid in the protection of the town's drinking water and help keep Plymouth Harbor clean. Thank you. Uh, we don't see any speakers. It's a majority vote. So we're going to go to the vote. Uh, we'll show it on the screen uh, for town meeting members so they can vote uh, on Article 9B. And uh, once we see that on the screen, we're going to begin the vote. Uh, there it is. 30 seconds. Vote now. Town meeting is voting on Article 9B. Uh, this is coming to you live on Saturday, October 17, 2020. We are here in PAC TV studios. We do have a help desk. The help desk number again, 774-773-6111. And as we move through town meeting, uh, that is available to town meeting members. They also have their materials, the report and recommendations of the Advisory and Finance Committee, also a supplement from the Advisory and Finance Committee. That completes the vote. We're waiting for the results. 119, yes. Zero, no, one abstentions. It carries. And we'll continue with Article 9C as we scroll through the precincts. Mr. Candy moves the town vote to authorize the Board of Selectmen to acquire by purchase for open space and recreational purposes pursuant to the Community Preservation Program and to accept the deed to the town of Plymouth of land located off 126, 120, and 0 Sandwich Street composed of 0.5 acres. And further, to appropriate 398,000. You have the text. It's a majority vote. Kevin Canty, Chair of the Advisory and Finance Committee. Just after the town meeting preview, it came to my attention that there was an error in the original roll call voting record in our report and recommendations book for this article in particular. The original roll call sheet says that Ashley Shaw voted in the negative when in fact she actually voted in the positive. As such, in a corrected vote of eight to four with no abstentions, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 9C. Approval of this article will appropriate 390,000 from the Community Preservation Act Fund Reserve for open space and recreational purposes. This acquisition will enlarge and enhance the Stevens Field plan to include easier public access, increased open space, and provide additional parking, including parking that will be used for overflow for town events. The parcels comprise a total of 0.45 acres located at 0, 120, and 125 Sandwich Street, abutting Stevens Field, and will be held in the care and control of the Conservation Commission. Thank you. We're going to begin with Precinct 5, Joan Bartlett, followed by 
Precinct 15, Richard Neely. Uh, Joan Bartlett is a Precinct 5 town meeting member. Good morning, Joan. Oh, um, Joan Bartlett here. Um, I'd like to encourage everyone to vote for this um, article, Article 9C, to buy the land next to Stephen Steele. Um, it will make an addition to Stephen Steele, but what it's in a way doing is replacing land that's been taken out to sea because of the recent storm surges we've had. It's a great old park, and there's so many people in town who are supportive of, supportive of this and would like to um, see it happen. We really need some more space there. We have to move the tennis court back and the, the playground back. And the citizens around town have enjoyed this uh, this park and its many amenities for years. We formed the Friends of Stephen Steele Committee in 1908, and um, I was able to capture some of the um, stories of some of the older people, and we made a little booklet out of it. Uh, just a couple of things. John Holmes remembers the circus coming to town and coming right by his house, which is next to the park, and the elephant. I mean, he had to stay home. He had pneumonia. And then Mary Henry, a longtime um, uh, member of, of this body, um, town meeting, um, she loved the memory of her mother and a lot of various old ladies from around the neighborhood sitting down there on the porch and keeping an eye on things and watching the children of various places. And uh, Mr. Serico, who was the um, he was the commissioner of recreation. Um, also ran a wonderful uh, baseball series of semi semi professionals. People would come to town and they'd make uh, play against various groups here in Plymouth. Um, so people in town are curious. They're concerned about Stevens Field, and we have a really good plan here that we open the um, community preservation committee has put together. Thanks. Thank you, Joan Bartlett, Precinct 5. Precinct 15, Richard Neely, followed by Precinct 12, William Abbott. Um, actually, procedural, I'm sorry, we're gonna stop for a minute. Uh, we're gonna take a motion to close debate. Um, the motion to close debate from Peter Neville, we'll take him off the queue, uh, and then we'll show the people who still wanted to be heard. Uh, so we don't wanna remove anybody else uh, from the speaker's queue. Uh, Let's show the uh, speakers, Richard Neely, Everett Malagudi, William Abbott are the speakers, and Donna Curtin. Those are the people who still wanted to speak. We're now going to take a vote on whether to close debate on Article 9C. And uh, so we will take a vote on whether to close the debate. And you'll see um, in a moment that we'll fix it so that it says, Yes, no abstain, uh, and we're going to wait. We're going to put up on the on the screen. We're going to put uh, an opportunity. There you go. Procedural motion. You're going to have 30 seconds. Voting starts now. It's a two-thirds vote. It's to close debate. Town meeting members are determining whether to close debate on 9C. Um, we are uh, in the second two-hour session of our fall annual town meeting. And uh, we're gonna continue um, with the warrant. And right now we're deciding whether to close debate on 9C. Uh, town meeting members are voting uh, on that. And then we will, depending on the results, determine how to proceed uh, with Article 9C. Uh, 70 say yes, 45 say no, zero abstentions. We're gonna continue uh, with the debate on this, we do not have uh, two-thirds. And so we're going to continue with Richard Neely, Precinct 15. Mr. Neely. Thank you. Uh, here we go. Uh, can you hear me? We yes. can. Go for it. And we can see you this time. Okay. I'd just like to point out that in the previous article, we were asked to pay $3,500 an acre to preserve our water supply 
and the watershed. In this particular article, we are being asked to pay twice as much, $8,600 an acre. And what are we getting? We are losing some valuable real estate from a tax point of view, and we are going to get for $400,000, two parking spaces and a view of the ocean. To me, that's not a good deal. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna continue Precinct 12, William Abbott, followed by Precinct 3, Donna Curtin. Uh, Mr. Abbott on Article 9C, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Butter. I request that the uh, four minute video of this article be shown at this time. The public has not seen it. It's perfectly germane and relevant to the article. And if the proponent of the article, Mr. Cohan, would like to have that video shown, he thinks it would be helpful in his presentation, I think it should be. It's only four minutes, that's what we're here for. So I would like to have it shown now if the uh, presenter so requests it. Yeah, Mr. Abbott, I believe the video is 11 minutes and uh, it was shown to the public at the presentation night. It was also sent out yesterday to all town meeting members. Uh, and I think at this point, uh, I'm gonna check with PAC TV to see what can be done. Uh, they said they have it. They said it's also available online. It's on YouTube and it can be seen. Uh, Mr. Abbott, did you receive uh, it yesterday? And do you recall that it was shown to the public at the presentation night? Yes, I did receive it yesterday, but here's, this is, this is a very important article in the downtown. And I, and I know a lot of folks think this addition along the waterfront is important. I think it is certainly germane. We're getting through this town meeting in a single you know, morning session. If it's 11 minutes, so be it. I think it should be shown. And uh, I think it should be shown right now because this is the article that's up on the line. It's gonna be decided one way or the other. Okay. Uh, this is really going beyond your three minutes. So if there are no objections, uh, from town meeting members. I do have a point of order uh, from Catherine Holmes. So uh, let's go to Catherine Holmes, Precinct 8, on a point of order. Um, so um, Mr. Moderator, I was just going to say that if you were not going to allow the video to be played, perhaps we could get a, take a vote on it. Because I, I do agree with Mr. Abbott. It is, um, it's, you know, it's, it's a really important piece of land. And I think that thank you. Uh, it's uh, worth- Thank you, thank Catherine. You. Unless anyone has an objection, we're gonna show it. Um, thank you for your point of order. Anyone else? Uh, if not, uh, PAC TV is gonna show uh, the video now uh, for uh, everyone's viewing. Uh, again, this is the video that's been prepared uh, in connection with this article. Thank you, Bill Cohan with Community Preservation Committee. Uh, the committee would like to now present our second article for Fall Town Meeting, and that's Article 9C. Article 9C, uh, this acquisition uh, is a land acquisition um, for active recreational, a recreational open space acquisition under the Community Preservation Act. It would enlarge Stevens Field for over an acre of land. Uh, this parcel that we're looking at is actually divided up in three different parcels of land. There's two right on Sandwich Street and there's one um, uh, next to the uh, two on Sandwich Street, but all of them abut Stevens Field. They enlarge Stevens Field. Uh, one would remember this property as the old former county auto property. Um, for many years, it was a, an auto pot store. Uh, recently, it was AutoQuest. Uh, next to this location, there's also a parcel that had Plymouth Bottling Works. Um, so it, it does have, it is a, a kind of a, a property along Sandwich Street that you would recognize if you drove by it. Here's a picture of Stevens Field from the year taken in the 40s, but this neighborhood hasn't really changed much since the 40s. There are uh, some different elements that have changed. This little bus station is now our fire station. This little gas station, I think it was Binding Gulf, uh, is now a repair shop. You can see the County Auto Park, park uh, parcel and the Plymouth Bottling Works. Behind it is the AK Finney Building, which was then became the PNB bus station um, repair shop. That was acquired by the town of Plymouth in the 70s as their DT. DPW bond and retired in the early 2000s and became part of Stevens Field. So Stevens Field has been growing over the years uh, in terms of its size. The Community Preservation Committee thought it was a unique opportunity uh, to add this land to Stevens Field. 
not only because we have numerous plan, uh, studies that have indicated that if you have a waterfront park in an urban area, you should try to enlarge that park for the growing population and uses that we'll outline uh, now. And that is that this acquisition would give greater access in functionality to the recreational space known as Stevens Field, uh, that the opening up the park to Sandwich Street uh, not only opens up some very interesting vistas from Sandwich Street, you're looking out at Long Beach, you're looking out at Clocks Island, uh, you're looking out at Saquish. It's a very uh, long sweeping view over our bay. Um, there is uh, an opportunity to enlarge a waterfront park in our downtown. Plymouth is flanked, downtown Plymouth is flanked by two parks, Nelson Park to the north, Stevens Field to the south. These parks act as supporting elements to larger events in downtown Plymouth. So when there is a parade or fireworks or a celebration, Nelson Park and Stevens Field take on these supporting roles to the larger events in downtown. So whatever we can do to improve Stevens Field and its size and magnitude. Um, there are, um, Issues that the Community Preservation Committee has noted, as many of you may know, in recent years, we've come to town meeting looking for money for planning a new Stevens Field. That planning process has been completed. We've put money aside for that construction. During the per permitting process, we did note that Stevens Field was uh, uh, experiencing uh, flooding during the winter months. Uh, and NOAA has released some new uh, expected sea level rise maps. The thought was that rather than trying to uh, raise the park and build expensive ball fields and basketball courts close to the water um, and tennis courts uh, and playgrounds, that we move that infrastructure away from the water, uh, saving the town the cost of trying to build so close to the water um, and compensating for that by looking at opportunities to buy land that would uh, help uh, balance that equation. As we move back away from the water, that we look at opportunities where we can buy land at a higher elevation. And that parcel, these parcels are at a higher elevation and they do provide that. You can see the lower part of Stevens Hill where the basketball court and the baseball field are. They're gonna stay where they are. Um, they, in the summer months, we can recreate on them. And then when the storms come in, they can act as kind of a, an absorption field area uh, where the sea can come in and be absorbed. Um, there will be some seawall construction, some elevation changes, but um, we're not going to go to some great extent to try to hold back uh, what we're experiencing at Stevens Field. We think it's more cost efficient to move back the infrastructure along with these tennis courts and the playground. They'll all be pulled back. Uh, this is the AK Finney property, P bus station property purchased in the late 1970s by the town of Plymouth. That parcel was made part of Stevens Field uh, about 15 years ago. Uh, it has been remained kind of a blank slate under the planning process. We're going to pull infrastructure back to this location and parking. These red little squares that you see down here on Sandwich Street, these are the three different parcels that are identified um, in this article. This is a close up of those three parcels. Note in between the two, the three parcels, there's a 14 foot right of way that is owned by the town already. This is a right of way to get into uh, the, the park. Um, you can see to the north, uh, the Plymouth Fire Station um, and the repair shop here, Finings Gulf um, is still operational. This parcel goes behind it. So it is a nice addition, uh, as I indicated before, to create this scenic overlook, this pedestrian entrance. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities here where we can increase parking and pull it back um, and also uh, open up the park uh, to the neighborhood. This is the County Auto property around the 1950s when it was a Chevrolet dealership. You can see to the right of that uh, photograph is the Plymouth Bottling Works. This is the parcel that fronts Sandwich Street that we're looking to acquire. This is a uh, picture in 2020 where the Chevrolet dealership is gone, Plym Plymouth Bottling Works is gone, and it's currently an open uh, field. The owner of the property went ahead and took down the property. They went through mass DEP. Uh, they went through a permitting process of testing, taking down the building, removing tanks, uh, and they paid for that. Uh, they're currently on record for those activities. It was noted that there is some additional cleanup that is required at the site. Uh, this vote of town meeting to set aside $390,000 for the acquisitions of the three different lots. 
would be contingent on uh, the town um, buying the property as Mass DEP has determined it to be clean. So we won't be buying if it is not clean to their satisfaction. Uh, so we continue to discuss with the owner the final uh, cleanup uh, activities that will be required before we purchase the property. Uh, but there's been a significant amount of work done so far. The building's been taken down, tanks have been removed. There has begun a significant cleaning process. Um, the next slide is looking towards downtown Plymouth, towards the fire station. You can see across the street, the old hollow fort house, the hollow house. Um, where it is now sitting there, dates from the 1670s. And for the first time in quite some time, it now has ocean views because these buildings have been taken down. So you can see the, the vistas that have already been created. This is standing on the property, looking over Stevens Field. So this is the, the view you have looking out at Long Beach. Um, the view sweeps to the left where you can see Clocks Island and the lighthouse and uh, at Saquish Head. And, um, and the, out at the Garnet, the lighthouse at the Garnet. So it has a really nice view from that vantage point. Uh, this is the ball field itself. The ball field will stay in the vicinity where it is today. There'll be some repairs to the park uh, under the new plan, uh, but it will, and you're seeing this in other cities where waterfront parks are being designed to be accommodating for the population during the summer months, but during the winter months, where we're gonna see surges that the park act as an absorption area. And um, right now, the town of Plymouth is involved in a municipal vulnerability program grant process where Commonwealth is asking towns to examine opportunities where they can pull back infrastructure. But there's actually grant money available under that uh, process. The town of Plymouth is on record with its new plan uh, to address these issues. So we're now eligible for grants uh, that would help us move back infrastructure. We'll be looking into that process to help with the construction of Stevens Field. This is the original plan that was proposed. After a few years, uh, we came to the conclusion that we needed to move more infrastructure back. So there was a revised plan uh, put together. You can see here in the revised plan, uh, we have pulled back the parking, we have pulled back the tennis, we'll pull back the playground. And again, the ball field and the tennis courts will stay where they, they are look, uh, currently. But you can see in the next slide, you'll see the two yellow spaces. Those are the, the, the land we're buying on Sandwich Street. So you can see how it sets up a nice um, connection to Sandwich Street where we can have pedestrian entrances, scenic overlooks, expanded parking. Uh, this will help improve the functionality of Stevens Field. And as we move forward on uh, the plan to uh, rebuild Stevens Field, it will be done in a manner where we maximize the use of these two these parcels that we're looking at for the acquisition. Currently right now, the Department of Marine Environmental Affairs has gone through a permitting process uh, to begin the construction. This fall, late this year, they will begin demolition and hopefully in the spring we'll begin construction of the new Stevens Field. Um, that concludes my presentation on Stevens Field. I uh, hope town meeting supports Article 9C. It's a unique opportunity to enhance the qualities of this waterfront property uh, right on Plymouth Harbor. This is the final shot of Stevens Field. Uh, this is the moon over Stevens Field as it sets behind uh, the Pine Hills. And again, that concludes our presentation on Article 9C. I hope that town meeting supports this article. It's a unique opportunity where we can increase the size of a park on our waterfront, giving access to the residents to a growing community where waterfront access is not readily available. Uh, also planning for the future by building a new park, pulling back our infrastructure mm -hmm. and utilizing the new act, these new parcels uh, to, uh, to address those issues that were outlined in the article. We hope that town meeting supports the article. Thank you for your attention. Uh, yes, under our town charter, uh, we're required to take a recess at least once every two hours. We're going to take a one-minute recess, uh, and then we're going to continue uh, through town meeting for another two hours. Uh, the recess begins uh, now at 11.59. We'll resume at noon. I'd like to welcome everybody back to our afternoon session of Plymouth Fall uh, Annual Town Meeting. It's coming to you live on Saturday, October 17. We are resuming at noon uh, following our brief uh, recess. We completed our morning session, and we are now continuing with Article 9C. 
Uh, precinct 4, Charles Votrain moves to close debate. Uh, it is not debatable. Uh, before we do that, I'm going to go to Brian Fitzgerald, who had a point of order. Uh, precinct 10, Brian Fitzgerald, uh, do you still have a point of order that you wish to uh, make at this time? Not entirely sure, Steve. I was responding to your invitation to object to showing an advocacy video that busts through all the speaking limits that the rest of us labor under. Um, but I see that point is now moved because you went ahead and showed it anyway. Okay. Uh, and I apologize. I did not see that earlier. Uh, but I, I will, uh, again, uh, recognize that point of order. Uh, thank you. Let's remove Mr. Fitzgerald now from the speaker's queue. Let's show the speaker's queue. Um, to town meeting members, we have four people, Everett Malagudi, Gene Patton, Lane, Virginia Davis, John Hammond, all who uh, indicated an interest in speaking. Uh, we will now go to the motion to close debate on Article 9C. Uh, it is a two-thirds vote. It will show it on the screen. Uh, and when we show it, we'll then have uh, 30 seconds in which to vote. Uh, town meeting members are going to be taking this procedural motion on whether to close debate. It's a procedural motion, uh, and it is two-thirds. What? Uh, I'm being told by OTI Technologies they need just a moment. Uh, so while they do that, I want to again I remind everybody that we are moving through the warrant. Uh, the consent agenda motion uh, did not pass, and therefore we will next move to Article 10, uh, which was originally contained in the consent agenda. It will now be uh, handled separately. We are waiting for OTI uh, to show us the procedural motion uh, to close debate. And um, it is a motion to close debate on Article 9C. And it is a two-thirds quantum of vote on the procedural motion to close debate. Town meeting has been in session since 8 a.m. Uh, this morning, uh, following opening ceremonies and presentations from uh, the select board and the school committee, uh, we continued with all of the articles up through and including now Article 9. Uh, town meeting members will be voting on whether to close debate on Article 9C. Uh, town meeting members have materials. Uh, they include the report and recommendations of the Advisory and Finance Committee. Uh, this is now before you. It says uh, terminate debate. It's actually on 9C, but it is a motion to end debate. You'll vote yes or no or abstain. You have 30 seconds. Begin voting. Town meeting members are voting on whether to terminate the debate on Article 9C. Article 9C, whether to close debate on Article 9C. Uh, this is coming to you live from PAC TV studios, from Plymouth North High School, and from remote locations uh, where town meeting members are located. We have 135 town meeting members. We have 15 precincts in the town of Plymouth. That concludes the voting on whether to close debate on Article 9C. 89 say yes, no, 30, zero abstentions. The motion carries. We're now going to go and vote on Article 9C. It's a majority vote. Town meeting members will now vote. We're not going to show the precincts on a procedural vote, but we will show on a substantive vote. We will look to the screen for the vote on Article 9C. Town meeting members will be voting on the main motion from the Advisory and Finance Committee, and other materials include a supplement to the report and recommendations of the Advisory and Finance Committee. And we're now going to vote on Article 9C, 30 seconds in which to vote. Please begin voting. Town meeting members are using a V voter platform in order to vote, in order to indicate uh, their interest in speaking on a motion. We're going to clear the speaker's screen um, for Article 9C. And in addition, uh, they are using the Zoom uh, video conferencing platform in order that they can attend town meeting through Zoom. And they can also be transferred as panelists uh, for this town meeting, so we have audio and video of town meeting members. Uh, the vote 102 yes, 16 no, zero abstentions. The motion carries. Article 10. Mr. Canty moves that the town vote to amend general bylaws, Chapter 9, Advisory and Finance Committee, as provided below with strike through language 
to be deleted. We're strolling through the precincts on 9C. Town meeting members have that strike-through language that has been proposed for this bylaw change. We've gone through all the precincts on 9C, so we're now going to go to Kevin Canty. He is the chair of the Advisory and Finance Committee who will speak on Article 10. Uh, Mr. Canty, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Moderator. In a unanimous vote of 12 to 0 with no abstentions, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 10. This article will amend the General Bylaws Chapter 9 Advisory and Finance Committee in accordance with the current annual departmental budget practice for how departmental equipment is listed. Thank you. Kevin Canty, Chair of the Advisory and Finance Committee. This is the majority vote. Uh, this was originally con included in the consent agenda. Uh, town meeting members did not support the consent agenda. Uh, I'm waiting. I do not see any speakers, so we'll go right to the vote for Article 10. Uh, Article 10 uh, is a vote to amend a general bylaw for the town of Plymouth. It's a majority vote, and you'll see it's here now. 30 seconds, begin voting. Town meeting members are voting now on Article 10. Uh, again, uh, it is an article to amend uh, a bylaw in the town of Plymouth. Uh, town meeting members have authority on financial matters. They also have authority on legislation, including bylaws. Uh, for the town of Plymouth. The voting is continuing. We have 30 seconds in which to vote. Uh, town meeting members have been doing this all morning. We're now in the afternoon session. That concludes the voting in Article 10. The vote 108 yes, 4 no, 3 abstentions. It carries. We'll scroll through the precincts so that town meeting members can confirm the vote was correctly recorded. Uh, and while we're doing that, I'm going to like to call on Precinct 3, Richard Barbieri on a point of order. Richard Barbieri, Precinct 3 on a point of order. If we can bring back in Mr. Barbieri. Um, we are watching the votes as they were recorded. Mr. Barbieri, welcome. Yes, yes, thank you, Steve. The, the voting screen never came up on my uh, computer, so I would have voted yes. A yes, we'll record a yes vote for Richard Barbieri. Thank you. And uh, at this thank time, you. we'll continue. I believe we scrolled through all the precincts. And so Article 11, we have no motion. Uh, hearing no motion, I declare no action. Article 12, I have no motion. Hearing no motion, I declare no action. Again, Article 13 was originally in the consent agenda. Uh, we are now handling it separately. And here is the motion. Mr. Canty moves that the town vote to amend its zoning bylaw. Section 206-1, Aquifer Protection District in accordance with a final report of the Planning Board to revise the Aquifer Protection District boundaries on the town's official zoning map. The quantum of vote is two-thirds. Kevin Canty on the motion. In a unanimous vote of 12 to 0 with no abstentions, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 13. Approval of this article will amend Plymouth's zoning bylaw to revise the town's official zoning map to modify the boundaries of the Aquifer Protection District to include a Zone 1 designation for the new Forges Field well as required by DEP. Thank you. Uh, any discussion on Article 13? Uh, I don't see any speaker requests. Therefore, we're going to go to the vote on Article 13. This will be a vote on the main motion on Article 13. It is to approve uh, to amend the zoning bylaw. And uh, Tom Bagley voted yes on Article 10. We'll record that uh, through OTI. Let's now show on the screen the vote for Article 13. It's there. Town meeting members have 30 seconds in which to vote. And the voting begins now. You're voting on Article 13. Uh, this is the last article uh, contained in the warrant. And absent any motions to reconsider, we'll be moving to a motion to dissolve the fall annual town meeting. We're currently voting on Article 13, and town meeting members are voting through the V Voter platform. They also have their Zoom video conferencing platform, and they're going between both uh, at this town meeting. The voting ends, uh, and we now see 110 voting yes, 
no zero one abstentions and it carries. We're going to scroll through the precincts so that town meeting members can uh, see how their vote was recorded. And while we do that, we will read into the record uh, the next procedural motion. Uh, Kevin Canty moves to dissolve the fall annual town meeting. We've now scrolled through the precincts. We can have any discussion. I'm not seeing any speakers. So we will now go to the vote on this. Kevin, did you care to be heard on the motion to dissolve? Uh, thanks for the opportunity, but no thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Kevin Canty. He is the chair of the Advisory and Finance Committee. Uh, and at this point, we're going to go to the voting uh, on uh, Article 13. We're going to show it up on the screen. And uh, this is Article 13. Uh, it, no, it should, to motion to dissolve. I'm sorry, motion to dissolve. Uh, I do want to announce Nathan Siegel uh, voted yes on 13. Dan Gorska voted uh, yes on 13. And again, Thomas Vaguely voted yes again. Those are votes to correct on 13. Now we're going to the motion to dissolve. You'll see here it shows a motion to adjourn. 30 seconds in which to vote. You can vote now. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for their participation in town meeting. Uh, and uh, we're going to be concluding uh, this session of town meeting. want to thank everybody in the opening ceremonies. Uh, thanks to PAC TV. Thanks to OTI. Uh, thanks to Nicole Manfredi, who worked remotely as assistant town moderator. Uh, thanks to the Plymouth Public Schools for the use of Plymouth North High School. Uh, thanks to all the boards and committees, and certainly thanks to town meeting members and everyone who participated in making this, uh, once again, a successful uh, town meeting. Uh, we're going to go to the vote. The vote is 116 say yes. One person doesn't want to dissolve, and one person will abstain. Uh, so with that vote, uh, town meeting is adjourned at 12.13 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>